Okay, hello. Hello, welcome to you. Part 26 of N of this. Um, I noticed that um, just looking at the total uh, video length, I'm, we're now just a few seconds past 125 hours of video. So that means, well, doubtless you'll be excited to hear that we're now a quarter of the way to the next 100 hour milestone. So congratulations for watching this. It's a, you know, a momentous occasion for you to be participating in. So well done. Um, what is this though? This is me writing a WebAssembly interpreter um, in Ruby for some reason. Um, I'm doing this to have fun, hopefully, to demystify WebAssembly, hopefully, and to share a little bit of, of how I do it. Um, just to remind myself, what are my principles here? Um, I'm more interested in having fun than making something that necessarily is 100% functional. Um, I want to get the code correct, even if that makes it slow. I want to make the code clear, even if that makes it not clever. I'm trying to do it all in pure Ruby. I'm trying to do it with no dependencies. That's the plan. Um, let me just start off uh, with a little retro of what happened last time. Um, basically not much. Uh, I did manage to clean up block handling a bit, which was good. I kind of improved the situation with stack unwinding, with sort of dealing with the calling convention when the uh, when the function body is a block. So that stuff's kind of a little bit more principled now, which is good. Um, I sorted out some confusion and some mistakes that I made earlier about how much of the block logic do we want to actually redo when we're inside the body of a loop. Um, you know, made the implementation tidier, made it a bit more expressive. Uh, sort of extracted out the common pattern of you know, starting a block and and the entire contents of the block being a WebAssembly expression. So I've now got that evaluate block helper to, to do that. Um, so that's quite good. Um, oh, and I also sort of consolidated to a certain extent the branch handling with the return handling inside uh, invoke function. So something that was previously handled in sort of two different ways is now closer to being handled in the same way. Um, I mean, the reason I'm mentioning this here at all is because on reflection, I think I still have some unfinished business with that code. Um, I'll talk about that uh, when I get started. But overall, I'm relieved that it's mostly working and that I understand it. So I actually have some insight into the WebAssembly semantics now, which I didn't have before. So... Yeah, broadly, I'd say that's a good thing. I'm pleased with that. Um, I also made some good progress on identifier contexts in the AST parser. Um, sort of relaxed the well-formedness condition a bit, figured out where I actually need, where the specification says I should be asserting well-formedness. Um, so I feel like I've got a slightly better grip on that. Um, I showed last time that I previously opened a spec on the sorry, opened an issue on the WebAssembly specification um, about whether shadowing is allowed for block labels or not. Uh, I mean, I've assumed the answer is yes, but I'm sort of still waiting for clarification on that one. No one's responded to that issue. Um, since last time, I've also opened another issue about how identifier contexts reach the body of function definitions, which I was confused about last time. I'll show you that in a second. Um, Again, I haven't had any response to that. Probably doesn't matter. Just for my own sake, I want to record these things that I'm confused about with the specification. I mean, there's a vanishingly small chance that they are actually problems in the specification itself. It's much more likely that there's a problem in my brain and that I don't understand the specification properly, but that's fine. Um, yeah, I just want to write them down, really. Um, I'm aware that there is certainly outstanding work still to do for other kinds of identifiers in the parser, like, I don't know, maybe tables and other things like that that I just haven't really touched yet. Um, those identifiers aren't being handled by the identifier context yet, so I'm sort of aware that that's out there. Um, but I haven't hit any tests that need that yet, and so I'm loath to sort of 
just add it in for the sake of it. I want to wait until I've got a failing test because then that'll tell me whether or not I've actually done it properly. Um, finally, I guess, I did some good sort of janitorial work last time, did some tidying up. Um, I removed some redundant code. I, in the interpreter, I wrapped up several kind of runtime attributes into a sort of module object um, just to represent that collection of all of the module related stuff for the function definitions and uh, everything else, whatever else goes in a, in a module. Um, memory, that goes in a module uh, and some other stuff. Um, but the main thing I did was that I just split out loads of uh, source code files and namespaces. So what was previously a very small number of very large Ruby files is now broken out into a, into a bunch of separate files. Um, and I think that's good. I probably should have done that a long time ago, uh, but it was just never important. And it's still not important, arguably, but it felt like a nice... It's like a nice threshold to cross to actually have a nice tidy lib directory with, you know, with lots of separate files that I can jump around between and, you know, maintain my cursor position in all of those different uh, Vim buffers and stuff. So I think that's going to make things just a little bit nicer. Um, I've still got lots of sort of small unrelated tasks on the to-do list. Um, but they can all just wait until I'm in the mood to deal with them, I think. Um, there are some larger jobs left over. Um, so, for example, the two pass, um, the two pass parsing of the S expression instead of a single pass. Um, but I think it'd be premature to do those big things now. I sort of want more of the overall implementation to be working so that I don't paint myself into a corner by sort of making assumptions that turn out to be invalid, basically. So I'm, for now, I think I'm just going to continue kicking those cans down the road and then come back to them. You know, when I know that I've got a fully operational AST parser, for example, like, then that would be a good opportunity to try and do some major surgery on it to move things around and change how it works. But right now I'm worried. Yeah, I'm just worried I'll make some I'll make some wrong decision in doing that. Uh, so I'll, I'll wait until I've, I know more, basically. Um, overall, with the tidying, I think I'm basically sort of happy to park it for a while now. I, I got the worst of it out of my system last time. I'm feeling like, you know, the surface, the kitchen surfaces are much cleaner than they were previously, which is all I wanted, really. Um, and the rest of those jobs will be there whenever I'm ready to do them. So I feel sort of relaxed about that. Um, so overall, I think it might be time for the pendulum to sort of swing back the other way um, and for me to start tackling a new language feature instead of just like incrementally refining the ones that I already have. So that's what I'd like to do this time, really. Um, let me press a button, press that button. That's a good button to press. And then let's get started. Um, so yeah, I mentioned, I'm just going to briefly show the uh what is it GitHub or assembly spec? Um so yeah, these are the two issues. This is the one I opened previously about uh shadowing. Um but this is the new one that I opened since last time, so yeah, th three days ago. Um and what I'm complaining about here is that I mean, I talked about this last time. I got stuck on it for a while. Um, you know, this, you can think about this funk production here. I mean, uh, just to recap, this grammar that we have for the, uh, what the spec calls the text format, you know, the, the human readable format of WebAssembly programs, this grammar basically defines a parsing function, you know. So this is saying when you're parsing a funk, um, and there's this sort of I that's a, a sort of an additional parameter, the incoming identifier context. Um, it says, well, here's what it should look like syntactically. And then this arrow is telling you here is what is generated by the parser. So this is sort of abstract syntax on the right hand side, essentially. Um, and what I'm complaining about is the fact that here I is incoming 
you know, the, the identifier context, which will be the sort of the initial identifier context uh, for the module that this function definition is inside, kind of comes in at the top here. Um, and then it sort of disappears. Like um, here it says, you can see the instructions in, in the function body here are evaluated in this I double prime identifier context, which is produced by composing uh, an identifier context called I prime with the names of all the local variables that are inside the function definition. So it's saying here that we get this, we get the identifier context for the function body by gluing together I prime, whatever that is, and the names of all the local variables. Um, I prime here comes from parsing the type use. And you can see that when you parse the type use, the incoming identifier context I is used there. But then when you look at this definition of type use, it sort of seems like I prime here is just a collection of the names of the local variables in the type use. So this, these are the names of the parameters. So if, you, if this type use is referring to some existing type def, you can list these parameters here to sort of give names to those types because they can't be named in the type definition. So basically it looks like this incoming identifier context I just sort of disappears. It's not, it's not part of I prime because I prime is just formed of the names of the locals. Um, and it's not part of I double prime because that is just I, pi, I prime plus, sorry, I should have said the names of the parameters here. Um, I double prime is just I prime plus the names of the locals. So this is why I was confused last time. I couldn't see how this incoming identifier context ever reaches the function body. And it sort of seems like it should have to because this function body might refer to other things that have got names. You know, it might... Uh, Let's remind myself of what kind of stuff has got names, you know, types or tables or memories or globals or data or anything like that. So we need I to somehow reach the function body here. And from these definitions of the parsing function, I just can't see how it can ever do that. Um, so that's what this issue says. <laughs> Uh, in a slight, hopefully slightly more concise way than I just said. Um, again, no one's responded to this. I don't know if anyone ever will, uh, but you know, doesn't matter, does it? I've I've reported it. That's the end of, more or less, the end of my responsibility. Um, anyway, so I think that brings us up to speed. Um, let's see what we've got to. Oh well, I'll tell you one thing that I can do. Ah, welcome, Nishar. How are you doing? Um, is that now I can just run test.sh without specifying where the, uh, <laughs> without specifying where the, uh, WebAssembly specs are. So yeah, I'd forgotten I'd done that. That was a nice little quality of life feature. Um, looks like the tests are passing. Okay. So that's good. Um, yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks. It was, uh, a pretty unpleasant day in London weather-wise and I got a bit wet when I was out on my bike earlier but now I have dried off and I'm ready to do some Ruby WebAssembly hacking stuff so yeah hopefully I'm doing all right um so yeah I did a bunch of stuff last time uh, I might delete these things that I've ticked off um but I also since last time I thought about some extra stuff about uh, where does this, I guess it's interpreter.rb now. Um, oh yeah, invoke function. So, I mean, I would like to get onto something else, but this is kind of a rollover from last time just because when I was reflecting on it and reading the code that I wrote, I was a little bit unsure that what I'd written was correct. Um, I suppose specifically that, okay, well, let's go through these in order. Firstly, should we really be calling evaluate block inside as block in invoke function? Isn't it evaluate expression? Now, um, let's have a look here. Uh, uh, as block it's called. Uh, when did I... Oh, that's just the function being, re the file being moved around. Um, 
Yes, this was the commit I was looking for. So this says use as block to unwind the stack upon return. Let's just um, get show this. Uh, oh. oh dear. So if I can find that again. That was a bit of a spectacular failure. Okay, this is the commit which I would like to see. Not the URL of this stream, which is what was previously in my paste buffer. Um, right. So this was a change I made to invoke function uh, to sort of reduce the duplication here because I was doing all of this business, you know, unwinding the stack and so on. Um, which is something that asblock does. Um, you know, this is the helper that does the stack unwinding. Um, so I sort of removed this stack unwinding stuff and just stuck a call to asblock in. Um, but in hindsight, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do because here, evaluate block, already calls as block. So I'm sort of, I'm not entirely sure why this hasn't broken anything. Um, well, I guess the reason is because this is always around the outside of the function body, but I, I think this is not right. I think this evaluate block is sort of a helper that means as block evaluate the function body. And I didn't really mean to put another as block around the outside of it. So now we've got sort of two sets of branch handlers here. I think the outer one is, well, yeah, I'm not, I'm a little bit confused about this, but I think ultimately I didn't intend because previously this was the branch handler around the function body, right? The, the evaluate block is calling as block that provides the branch handler around the body of the function. And now I'm putting my own branch handler around the body of the function. I don't think I want or need the one inside evaluate block. So this was just sort of an oversight. Like when I added this and plus none of the tests broke. So like I didn't notice it wasn't right, but I think that it's not what I meant. I think what I meant was in this commit, what I wanted to do was essentially unwrap the branch handler here and, and turn this into just evaluate the function body and then sort of I've lifted the branch handler, this as block helper around the outside. So that's a long winded way of saying, I think what I wanted was for this to actually be evaluate expression. And that's what I'm trying to say here isn't it evaluate expression. So this makes more sense to me because now we've just got the one branch handler around the block that is the function body. And we are mostly just evaluating the expression, but there's also some other machinery here to deal with the calling convention. So to deal with like, well, the calling convention being that we pop the appropriate number of values off of the stack. And then we make them into local variables, essentially. Um, actually, so the signature of this is different. This doesn't take the type. So I think that's just evaluate the body with the locals. Um, so actually, now that I look at that, that, God, I remember I mentioned this last time, I was sort of annoyed that the function type is sort of used here and then it was used again here and it didn't really make sense to me. But now, I mean, maybe I should have paid attention to that feeling because now we don't need the function type here because the only things that need the function type are the branch handler and we need it here to, to be able to do the calling convention. Um, yeah, I think this is all correct. Well, let's run the tests and find out. 
Oh, welcome, Chris. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Uh, Chris says, is the formal specification just written by humans? If it's not generated, tested or validated, I wouldn't trust it as much as you are. <laughs> I'm sure you're right, Chris. Um, as far as I know, it is just written by fallible humans. So I think I'm, I'm sure you've got a point there that it is reasonably likely to contain errors. It's more that I just don't trust my own it's more that I don't I don't feel confident in my ability to read it correctly, I suppose. I'm not saying it's unlikely to have mistakes in it. It's more that I don't feel particularly confident that I'm reading it correctly. But yeah, I'll, uh, I will accept that I may be trusting it more than is warranted. Um, so, I mean, I'm in a precarious situation here where, like, the thing I did before wasn't causing any problems... Uh, sort of operationally the only problem it's causing is that when I went back and looked at this code I was surprised to see evaluate block here because it doesn't seem right so this feels more correct to me this as block is still and this was a thing that was previously called with branch handler right which like I said here is this really a clearer name like you have to remember that that's what as block is doing now um so this registers a branch handler around this code. And then here we've got a sort of a sort of a different kind of branch handler. Like this is this is catching return specifically. Um, and I think those are the two things that we want. We want to handle branches and we want to handle returns. What we don't want is for this to also be adding another branch handler because that's just not right. So it was sort of working by accident before, and now I think it's working deliberately. So that's good. Um, so what I want to say about this, um, use evaluate expression, not evaluate block in invoke function. And then let's say, what do I want to say here? I think I made a mistake in, what was that? What was that commit that we were just looking at? This one. So I think I made a mistake in blah when I added what was it as block around yeah add it as block around yeah evaluate block basically because it existed before hello chris lois in addition to chris setter welcome how nice to see two chrises on this fine London evening. I hope you're both well. Um, yeah, so yeah, in an attempt to reduce duplication, I've sort of doubled up on my branch handler there. So let's say when I edit as block around a call to evaluate block, uh, this means that there are two branch handlers around the function body, which isn't what we want. The right thing to do is remove the inner branch handler, i.e. call evaluate expression directly without going through as block. Uh, the previous code worked fine because, why did it work fine? Um, well, I think the answer is the outer branch handler uh, could never be activated by any valid branch, uh, its relative index was too low. So what I mean by that is a valid program is only ever going to try and branch out as far as the function body, its enclosing block in the function body, and so if you add another block around it by mistake, that block that block will just never be used. Um, so let's say its relative index um, 
effectively minus one with respect to the function body was too low to ever be used. Um, and was only activated uh, in response to a return. Now, the same branch handler is being used for explicit branches to the enclosing block of the function body as is used for return, which is how it should be. Uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit waffly, but I think it it gets the it gets the idea across. We don't need that redundant uh, branch handler. So I think I'm just going to check that off. I mean, when I wrote this, I wasn't I was sort of a bit unclear about whether the, what I wrote here was right. But now looking at it, I can see that this obviously is right. So I think that's I think that's good. Um, what's this about? Could we use the function type to get the right number of results in a cert return? Should we check the stacks empty afterwards? Oh, right, okay, so this is about, I mean, this is sort of on a slightly different different topic, so maybe we could come back to this. Uh, no, let's have a look. Uh, oh yeah, we don't actually parse it here anymore. So I think this was, again, as I was just looking through the code, it sort of snagged on my brain is this it? Um, expecteds.length. Yeah, I think this was sort of bothering me that it's... When we've got an assert return, um, we have a function that we're going to invoke, and then we have these sort of expecteds. So this is an array of like the return values that we're expecting that we're, as part of that assertion. Um, and then when we invoke the function, so when you invoke a function, it leaves some number of values on the stack. Um, and well, maybe this is, I, I just realized we are, we are checking the stacks empty afterwards. So that's not relevant. But what is relevant is that it's a little bit weird that this is just popping off the right number of values according to the assertion. Whereas now we've got enough information because we've got the function type, we know how many values it returns. So really here, whenever we're calling a function and we want to get the return values, well, obviously in these cases, we want to leave the return values on the stack. Um, Oh yeah, it looks like this is actually the only place where we in Ruby try to retrieve what the function values are, well, what the, what the function's return values are. But I think the right thing to do here would be to say uh, function.type.results.length. What do we say in invoke function? Oh, but we don't have an instance of Yeah, function's only got a type index. We need invoke function to leave its results on the stack, basically, because in the interpreter, you know, when we return from a function call, for example, we just want those return values to be on the stack. Um, so I don't want to make invoke function actually return those values. I want it to leave them on the stack. Um, maybe I can just get away with doing this here. Actually, I'm not sure how important this is. Because this was working fine before. Um, Okay, well, it seems to still be working, okay. Um, I think I'm going to 
leave it like this because this is the right thing to do. In fact, I'm going to like make this part of, you know, we're sort of looking up the function basically. Um, oh, hi, Tim. Welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, I am well, thank you. I hope you are as well. How lovely for you to join us. Thank you. Uh, this might be a, a little underwhelming in comparison to one of your streams, but I hope you enjoy be <laughs> being in the audience for once. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Uh, yeah, I was saying, like, effectively, this is where we look up the... This is where we look up the function... So it makes sense that this is where we look up the type. And then down here. Um, yeah, I think this is okay. We evaluate the expression, we invoke the function, and then we use the type of the function to retrieve the results. And then, yeah, we continue to raise an exception unless the stack is empty. So I suppose there's now no guarantee that these two arrays are going to have the same length like if you zip two arrays of different lengths i think it'll just get padded out with nils if if expected is longer than we thought it was going to be so maybe there should be a sort of raise unless uh i don't know expected length equals actual values dot length because that was that was established previously by make by using the number of expecteds to decide how many things to pop off the stack. So like this doesn't really change the semantics of what we're doing. It just it, I just wanted I really I wanted this to be the line of code that comes after invoke function basically. Like you evaluate all the arguments to the function and they end up on the stack, then we invoke the function and then we use the type of the function to determine how many results there should be. I mean, I'm sorry, this is getting a little bit uh, esoteric. You know, maybe it's okay to just use the entire stack contents to just say, given that the stack is eventually, it is initially empty here. Well, these things are all equivalent. I think, I think I'm most comfortable with this, with saying like, the calling convention is you invoke the function and then you'll get whatever the type of the function is will tell you how many results you get on the stack afterwards and so you can pop them off and then these two things here are really just sort of sanity conditions after that where it's like well we we imagine that the stack was initially empty is the stack empty again you know have we consumed all of the arguments have we popped the right number of results off of the stack and then this is just again well, this is compensating for the fact that this zip is otherwise not going to check this for us. Um, so I think that's okay. I just feel like I've been a little bit unnecessarily pedantic there. Um, but that is kind of the name of the game. Uh, oh, okay. Well, Tim says, I find myself adding more and more such sanity checks in my code. So there we go. Uh, Completely justifiable then, thank you. Uh, if anyone has a problem with me adding this, then just go speak to Tim. Uh, it's Natalie's fault. So, um, all right, so this is, I mean, yeah, this is a bit silly, isn't it? So this is just like uh, use uh, function return type to decide how many uh, results to pop from the stack. Um, so I'll just add a note here that says uh, this isn't really any different to what we were doing before, but it's a little more principled and therefore hopefully clearer to consult the function type when deciding how many results to pop off the stack afterwards 
rather than simply trusting uh, the number of expected values in the assertion. Um, uh, this change probably won't affect uh, anything about the behavior of the assertion. If it passed before, it'll pass now, uh, and vice versa. I guess. But that it just clarifies that it's not, I'm not actually changing anything. Oh, hi, Kevin is, Kevin Newton is here as well. So Kevin says, I do it too, but use or instead of, use the word or instead of double pipe because it has lower precedence than the assignment. Doesn't matter in practice though. Uh, oh, you're talking about this, you're talking about this sort of suffixed raise here. Interesting, I didn't think of that. I'm not sure why I never use, I never sort of type out and and or. I think maybe because although I know that they're lower precedents, I sort of don't know how low, like are they the lowest precedents operators in Ruby? Like are they lower than everything? That's what I think, but because I'm not very confident, um, I don't tend to use them. Kevin says, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the assignment value is the same as the value being assigned, right, yeah. Oh yeah, and Tim is pointing out that Rubocop has bullied him into never using those. So yeah, maybe that's the reason why, I've, why I stopped using them is because I feel like I was tired of being told off by Rubocop. Good uh, Ruby syntax trivia from Kevin, of course. If, unless, while, until are lower precedence than the word and and the word or, well, I definitely won't remember that. I'll, <laughs> uh, next time I need to know something about operator precedence, I'll just, um, I'll just ping you, Kevin. That's my, you can be my outboard brain for remembering Ruby operator precedence. Um, so yes, it turns out we can use the function type to get the right number of results in assert return, and that's, that can now stop bothering me. Um, right, so I've sort of been dancing around this. This was the thing I really wanted to look at, which is, Okay, well, given there are actually a couple of people in the live chat and you might not have um, might not have seen this before, let me just briefly introduce what I'm talking about here. So in WebAssembly, you, the branch instructions, um, by the time I've parsed them, uh, just have an index, right? So you say branch three or something. And because WebAssembly is sort of structured, what those branches, those aren't branches to arbitrary labels, they're branching, they're sort of jumping out of a certain number of enclosing blocks. So if you branch zero, that means effectively either terminate the current block, if it's a regular block, or return to the top of the current block, if it's a loop. So it can be a forward or a backward jump, but it's a jump either to the beginning of the immediately enclosing block or to the end of the immediately enclosing block. Whereas if you say branch one or branch two or branch three, you're jumping out of, you know, jumping out of the parent block or jumping out of your grandparent block or whatever. And the way that I've implemented that is that I've got this as block handler um, that that just yields to the Ruby block that you pass it, you, that you pass to it, and it basically just sticks a catch around it. So I'm I'm catching this symbol called colon branch, uh, and then if we look at, in, you know, instructions that actually do branching, they just throw this symbol. So you know, here's a conditional branch, here's an unconditional branch. Uh, I think there are. Yeah, BR table is like a more elaborate indirect branch, but they all just throw this branch symbol and they throw it with the index. And then the idea there is that we always, well, you know, we have to always catch that. And if we do catch it, then, you know, this is, this, this is essentially like a recursive function here that says if the payload of this, so you see when we when we throw it, we pass along the index as like the payload of the throw. So if it's zero, then that means that 
we are the branch, we are the block that is being targeted by the branch, right? Either, well, in the, in the base case, someone said branch zero and we have caught that. So now that means we have to, this is unwinding the stack and like just dealing with either terminating or restarting the current block. Um, but if the index is not zero, then we decrement it and we rethrow that symbol so that, you know, there will be an enclosing one of these, you know, there'll be an as block that's outside this one that will then recatch that thrown symbol and now result will be one step closer to being zero. And if it's still not zero, we, th we throw it. So there's a sort of slightly wonky setup I've got here. It's not that wonky, like it works fine, but like this was just something I cobbled together to get it working. Um, and then there's the sort of slightly messy situation where there's another symbol that you can throw called return um, which is if this return instruction appears inside the body of a function, anywhere inside the body of a function. Um, and this is just a special kind of branch that always branches out of the function body. So we need this to sort of percolate all the way out of however many enclosing blocks it's in until it hits the function body and then it terminates that block because the function body is like an implicit block. And the way I've done that is that this throws a different symbol called return. I wrap this around, I sort of catch this outside of the function body. And so if anywhere in the function body says return, we catch that here. And then one of the changes I made last time was rather than repeat all of the stack unwinding calling convention stuff that needed to be done here, I just used a regular branch handler around it. And then I sort of trigger that branch handler by throwing, <laughs> by throwing branch with an index of zero here. So it's all a little bit, um, I would say Heath Robinson, North Americans would say Rube Goldberg. Basically, it's all a little bit janky. Um, and since last time I was thinking about this, oh, thanks, Tim. Tim says that's a cool, really cool use of throw and catch. Um, it is kind of cool. Uh, it's a feature I don't use very often. I mean, effectively, what I'm doing here is the thing I've done all the way through this project, which is just lean on the Ruby call stack to do stuff. Like the WebAssembly specification is phrased very much in terms of a, it's like a, a small step operational semantics. So effectively, it's like a little abstract machine that ticks like one tick at a time. So the, the feeling it gives you is that your interpreter is just gonna be a while loop with a switch statement inside it. And depending on what the next instruction is, you're just gonna do one of those things and then you're going to fall out the end of the switch statement and then it's going to be the next iteration of the while loop. And I haven't, at least up until this point, I haven't implemented my interpreter like that because if I do it like that, I have to do all of the maintenance of all of the stack-like data structures myself. Um, and that's, I've had to do that for the operand stack anyway, but like for the call stack inside WebAssembly, it feels at this point, easier to just use the Ruby call stack. And that's what using throw and catch allows me to do is like, because when I call evaluate expression here, that's gonna sort of recursively evaluate everything inside the function body here. Again, it's not it's not evaluating one tick per iteration. It's actually gonna go and recursively evaluate all of the stuff inside the function body. And this is gonna be sitting around on the Ruby call stack, like waiting if there's a throw anywhere inside there, I'm going to catch it. Whereas when you look at the operational semantics of WebAssembly in the specification, it's much more like, oh, you have to maintain a stack of labels that represent all of the enclosing blocks. And then when you execute certain kinds of instructions, you have to find the nth label that's on the label stack and all of that. And I'm not doing any of that. I'm just saying, well, I'm just going to stack up as many of these nested, you know, catch blocks <laughs> as I need. And they're all going to sit there on the Ruby call stack and they're just going to be ready to deal with um, anything that gets thrown. Uh, Kevin says, thoughts on throw and catch versus raise and rescue. Curious why you chose that one. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I have a brilliant answer to that. It's, I suppose it's more that... Well, I suppose ultimately the question is why does Ruby have both of those features in the first place, given that they are essentially equivalent in terms of they both allow you to sort of unwind the Ruby call stack to an arbitrary point, right? Um, this using throw and catch felt a little more 
ergonomically appropriate given that it allows you to <laughs> given that it has an affordance to provide a payload right so the fact that i was able to um just straightforwardly provide this index integer and then have that just plop out nicely when i catch it felt quite good and obviously i could achieve the same thing by squirreling that away into a um i mean you tell me kevin whether it be whether there's a better way of doing this but my mental model of raising is that essentially you can only provide an exception object i mean i get maybe that's not true i don't even know i'm saying that i'm like what even are the arguments to raise Oh God, what's this? Why do you, what, what's the string in the array? Like, I feel like I'm going to be hoist by my own petard here. I've never, <laughs> let's just, let me stick to things which are true. I have never used these arguments to raise and I don't know what they're for. Um, sets the message. Oh yeah, okay, I knew about that. Um, the array of callback information. Okay, well, I don't think any of this is like, legitimately places where I could put information like that index. I think the place where I could legitimately put it is inside the exception object, right? Like I could I could make a custom exception class that would be able to contain this index and then I could just unwrap the exception to get it out rather than using the return value of catch. So I'm, yeah, I don't know. It just felt a little bit more natural. I don't have a better explanation than that. I mean, one of the things that I dislike about this and that you can see I'm having to work around with this local variable is that I don't know any way, any native way, apart from abusing control flow, which is what I'm doing here, to know whether this catch block was like activated. Like this block just finishes execution. And unless you somehow communicate either in the return value of this block or in a side effect of this block, like whether execution actually reached the end or not, like there's doesn't appear to be any way of knowing. Whereas I guess if I'd used exceptions, I I know that if I'm in the rescue clause, then like a branch happened. So from that respect, now that you've asked the question and now that I've thought about it, that would have been a little tidier than this kind of mutable state that I've in, had to introduce to sort of record whether execution successfully reached the end of this yield without activating the catch block so yeah interesting uh kevin says that's a good question i guess the question of why they're separate uh why they both exist they break down to the same code in c ruby he says you'd have to raise an exception but you would have a custom exception class where you pass your info into the constructor yeah that's what i said right um yeah we're talking past each other because of latency yeah that's kind of what i was thinking about here for ensure else rescue yeah so feels a little bit zero sum right like this well i'm about to get on to a, a, a new thing but based on what i've already done i think i think if i'd use an exception class like a custom exception that would have been better because it would have let me use rescue here to determine whether we branched um but it just sort of doesn't feel right. I mean, this is not very rigorous, but like a branch isn't an exception. Like semantically, it's not an exception. I know that in terms of control flow, there's really no difference. Like we are we are unwinding the call stack and that's essentially exception handling. But given that Ruby provides this affordance to do something, it's not quite a go-to. Um, and, you know, it's certainly not quite you know, call CC, like it's not, doesn't quite give you the ability to just sort of grab a continuation at any point, like it's structured. So it's not, you know, it's not to be considered as harmful as go to, but like it gives you that same flavor of structured stack unwinding for control flow, but without having to say raise <laughs> and rescue, like there's like, you know, like you're reading a file that's run out of bytes or you're trying to read from a socket that's um, that's been closed or something. So maybe that's my excuse, is that it's not an exceptional situation. We do actually expect branches to happen, but I am very aware that that's kind of weak source and um, 
exceptions are used for control flow all the time. Um, anyway, the thing I wanted to say, that last 20 minutes of tedious Samuel Beckett monologue was all to say that Colonel Catch will generate a unique tag here if you don't provide it. And I'd sort of forgotten about this. Um, oh, Kevin says that's fair. Okay, thank you. Yes, it is more art than science, I suppose. I mean, this is this is what programming's like, right? Is making weird value judgments based on nothing except your own gut, <laughs> gut feel. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, I'm... You know, one of the things I don't like about this is that I just had to invent, like, what's the magic symbol here? Or, like, what's the magic object that is going to be thrown? And I just said, well, I'll just use a symbol and call it branch. But when I thought about this, I sort of remembered that Catch does this, where if you don't... Yeah, here's an example of it. If you don't provide... If you don't specify what is the unique object that is being that I'm supposed to catch when it's thrown, it will synthesize a new object. I guess this just calls object.new or something. Oh yeah, as from object.new. So it's effectively just allocating a new blank object. And then that gets yielded to the block. Um and this made me think that like I just got off saying it's like this isn't like call CC. It's not like you get a continuation that allows you to just resume execution whenever you like. But this is a little bit like that because the object that's generated by catch here, you know, we could generate a unique object, but like, again, this is an affordance, right? It's saying like, if you, if what you want to do is to be able to terminate this block specifically at any time, then here is an object which will allow you to do that. And that just made me think that like, my existing scheme here of this sort of bodge that I've got that involves the branch symbol and the return symbol and then sort of decrementing integers and stuff. I mean, I'm not particularly or in fact at all worried about performance here, but just in terms of like the elegance of this setup, like the fact that this is having to recursively rethrow the same symbol multiple times and bumping that index down one each time is a little bit inelegant and and potentially makes it harder to understand like if i could arrange to not do this if i just said like if i just get a tag here and then i make i arrange for this tag to be the thing that's thrown instead of throwing these symbols return and branch like if i could arrange for the call site of throw to have access to the correct tag, then I'd be able to jump straight to the correct enclosing block and not have to do this work anymore, right? Not have this conditional that is like, well, there's a base case here, and then there's this sort of, you know, the inductive case or whatever, the recursive case here that's just sort of repeating the same operation and relying on the fact that if you subtract one from an integer enough times, you're eventually going to hit zero. Like, so that's a long-winded way of saying I sort of want to try and tidy this up so that none of these are throwing this branch symbol anymore. Like, what I would like to do is just remove this code here and say, if catch was activated here, again, using this slightly wonky setup here to detect that, then that means that a branch targeted this block specifically. Like, we don't need a payload, um, but we are taking advantage of the fact that we get a special object here um, that allows us to identify this block uniquely. So, I think what I was thinking about here was like... Yeah, I think maybe I just need to... I need to think this through. Like... What I would like to be able to do is <sighs> what I'd like is to have some state in the interpreter, right? Like right now I've got an operand stack, but here if I had like a stack of tags, 
If you did like tags.push tag, and then I guess I'd need an ensure block here that was like tags.pop, then what that would do is maintain a stack. So as we if if when we descend into the yield here, the yield is actually evaluating another expression that introduces another block and we end up here we end up at this line of code again and then we establish a new catch block that generates a new tag and we push that onto the stack and so on and then i'm sort of using the ensure block here to make sure that even if this even if this yield here like ends up activating a catch block that's outside of this one we sort of maintain the hygiene of that stack so it's like as soon as we leave this lexical scope as soon as control leaves this block we're going to make sure that that tag gets popped off um i think this is enough to maintain a sort of well well structured um stack of these unique tag objects that are generated by catch and then if we've got that then whenever we do a branch, we can just index into it. So rather than using the index, rather than making an index a part of the payload of the thing that we're that we're throwing, instead we throw the tag itself and we use the index to decide which of the tags on the stack we're gonna we're gonna throw. Does that make sense? Um, so here where I say, oh, hold on, let me think about this. Right, so what I had in mind here was to be able to do, instead of throwing the branch symbol, to be able to throw like tag slice index. Um, I've just realized that in order for that to work, I shouldn't use push and pop, I should use sh unshift and shift, right? Because I want this to, if the index is zero, I want this, I mean, obviously I could, I could fiddle about with this index, but like, why not keep the tags in the right order? So I think if I, if I unshift, which means push onto the front, basically. So if this is unshift, make this tag be at index zero, then that means if inside this yield, I immediately hit a branch instruction, branch zero, which means terminate the enclosing block, then that's going to pick the zeroth tag on the stack, which is the one I just pushed onto the front of it. So I think that's the way around. And then this one needs to be shift. So I think the... I think the basic idea was good there, but just the, you know, the actual implementation wasn't quite right. So, I mean, I don't have, I also don't have this tags attribute, but I can fix that in a sec. So, uh, unless condition zero. So I just want to, where are all the throws, basically? Um... Um, I'm not going to think about that for a second. I just want to, yes. Okay. So that's, oh no, hold on. I, I sort of paused because I was confused about what to do about return, but this, you know, this is the same kind of deal, right? It's like, <laughs> oh. hold on. Oh, this is like tags dot first if returned. So that's, that's just the same modification as I made elsewhere. Is like don't throw branch anymore. So hopefully, right. So I mean, I'm I'm changing quite a lot of code here, but I think this is like a single meaningful change, which is to Let's just do this. Tags, uh, self.tags is empty. I am a little bit skeptical about this, but let's see where this goes. I can, I think I can, I think I can see a problem that I'm going to have here, but that's fine. Um, okay, so we'll leave return alone for now. Um, Oh, hold on. 
yeah, I will leave return alone for now, but I think fairly obviously I can also, if I've got this stack of tags, because... Yeah, so actually maybe this will be fine for now. I think the, the, the problem I was anticipating was to do with return. So I think maybe if I leave return alone for now and then we can come back to return. Um, so yeah, I've got rid of all of the places that throw that branch symbol and then inside as block, I'm just doing the sort of pushing and popping the tags. I'm sort of expecting that this is going to work. I mean, that might be ridiculous hubris on my part, but in my head, that makes sense. I don't have to wait a while for it to actually do any kind of branching. Okay, well, this is hopeful. Wow. Okay, so that did work. So, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I wasn't necessarily expecting that to work. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an improvement. I think being able to make this sort of unconditional, you know, assuming that the branch has happened, then we're done. You know, that we only enter this block if we're a branch target, and so we have to unwind the stack and then there's just this business of like well do we was it a backwards jump or a forwards jump basically but otherwise i think that this is nicer uh i guess the downside is that i've introduced another explicit data structure to hold all of these things rather than just using integers but i think well specifically the thing this is going to make easier is it's going to make return easier but i haven't I haven't looked at that yet. The reason it makes return easier is that I can just immediately retrieve the tag for the outermost block because that's always going to be the last one on the stack, right? So here I'm doing this to, to trigger the branch handler for the enclosing block. But, you know, this is what I do when I catch that return symbol. But instead, inside the actual implementation of return, I can just, instead of letting expecting that return symbol to bubble all the way up and be caught i can just immediately branch to the correct block at that point but i'll do that in the next commit and like i said i i think some i think that's not going to work properly because i don't have activation records for functions at the moment but i i'm sure i can make that work so i think this is a self-contained change uh i'm not entirely sure how to describe it though maybe i can just talk about the tags specifically so i can say something like use generated tag objects instead of uh well, let's say for branching uh instead of branch and a number <laughs> um uh, this allows the branch instructions to directly target one of the enclosing blocks by throwing the unique object corresponding to that block instead of throwing the generic branch symbol and relying upon an integer index payload uh, to either handle or rethrow uh, that symbol. Um, I think <laughs> that this is a bit clearer and simpler than the previous setup although it does require us to maintain the stack of current tags so that branch instructions can retrieve the appropriate one uh, based on the index of the branch. 
Um, the real benefit is going to be when we use these tags to implement uh, return. But I haven't done that yet. Uh, let's say uh, I'm expecting we'll be able to use to reuse the existing tags, which will unify the mechanism of branches and returns. Well, unify the mechanisms, I suppose. Uh, that'll do. I think I've said enough there. Okay, so let's just think about how, how I make return work. So at the moment, we've got this extra ceremony here for catching the return symbol and then re... sort of... because return is just a special kind of branch that doesn't specify its index, uh, we've got this mechanism that allows us to catch a different symbol and then sort of convert it into the correct branch, effectively. But I think that now we've got those tags, I can probably... get rid of all of that and just allow just rely on as block dealing with the return um, but in order to do that we can't throw the return symbol anymore we've got to throw the correct tag now like I said where previously this was just throwing tags first I think probably well, let's let's just work through it. If we throw tags.last, then that's going to that's going to be the one that's like in some sense on the bottom of the tag stack, so it's going to be the outermost block. So within the scope of a single function, that's the right thing. It's like we've entered a function body um uh, as we saw before. A function body is itself a block. So when we enter as block here, that is going to, we're going to go into the catch block. Um, we're going to, we're going to generate a new tag. It's going to be pushed onto the front of the tags stack. Um, and then if we descend into multiple nested blocks, that tag is going to be pushed out, you know, depending on which way around you want to think about it, but the index of it is going to be increased in the, in the tag stack. Um, but it's always going to be the last one because every time we get a new one, we're pushing it on the front so that it has an index of zero. Um, so, yeah, if what we want to do is immediately jump to that outermost block, then that will be the last tag on the stack. Now, the, th <laughs> the thing I'm worried about is what do we do about function calls? Um... Because my expectation here, I mean, I should just run the test, but my expectation here is that this will work fine as long as we've only, basically as long as we don't call another function. But if we, if anywhere in the test suite, we call, you know, we've got an assert return that calls function A, and then function A calls function B, and then function B calls return, then that is supposed to terminate the execution of function B's body and then return control to function A. But what will actually happen here is that the, the outermost tag in my stack of tags will not be the one corresponding to function B's body. It'll be the one corresponding to function A's body. So it's gonna, the control flow is going to be wrong. So I kind of already know that what I've done here is not going to work. Or at least in general, it's not going to work. The thing I don't know is whether... The test suite actually cares about that. So yeah, none of these tests exercise uh, branches at all. Um, it's not until we get a bit later. Oh, BRF. Oh, okay. All right, so that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, Tim. In principle, it's a problem for future me. Turns out uh, the future arrived. Soon. <laughs> 
<laughs> sooner than one might hope. Um, so yeah, it's sort of interesting that you can see the tests for branches and, you know, these are unconditional branches, conditional branches. Uh, I guess that's it. Um, pass just fine and the test for function definitions pass just fine. I'm pretty sure that this includes testing return. Oh, and actually look, return dot last. So we got quite a long way before that contrived scenario I just described occurred, but apparently in if dot last inside add 64 u saturated. Um, let's see what's going on there. I mean, maybe this is some other problem that I hadn't anticipated, but uh, let's see. Okay, so f64 u saturated. So yeah, sure enough, it does call another function, add 64 u with carry, which is this one. And yeah, okay, sure enough, this contains a return. So this is exactly the nightmare scenario that, <laughs> that I was concerned about. So yeah, unfortunately, this return here is not just going to return from add 64 u with carry, it's also going to return from add 64 u saturated, which is clearly not correct because there's more function. <laughs> uh, we're not ready to, you know, again, I suppose, yeah, what I should have said was, if this call was in like, not tail position, but like if this was the final instruction in the function body, then I think that would actually have been fine because um, even when we return from this function here, if this had been the last instruction in the body, then we would have finished this block as well. So it would have been fine. But this was a stipulation I didn't make in my laborious description of what I thought the problem was, which is there's actually more to do after the recursive or the, the nested function call returns. So yes, unfortunately, I've broken it. Um, so obviously I have to deal with this. Uh, it's really tempting to do the thing that I've done elsewhere which again is to essentially abuse slash use the function Ruby's call stack, right? Because what I need to do, you know, the whole problem happens when we invoke a function, right? When we invoke a function, then, and again, this is, this manifests differently in the WebAssembly specification, which talks about pushing, it's just got a single unified stack. So it has a, you know, for the little abstract machine that it defines, it's got a stack that contains not only operands, uh, like numbers and stuff for the instructions to operate on, but also labels. And I think also like effectively stack frames, like act activation records for the functions. And I think all of the rules about branching and stuff like that, talk about like stopping you can't go or at least the validation would do this you know you can't go beyond the nearest activation record you know you can't branch outside of the current function um, but at the moment this setup does nothing to prevent that in as much as if you've got if function a equals function b equals function c equals function d you'll just end up with the tags for all of those function bodies just hanging out on that tag stack and in principle, any of my implementations of, well, for example, return right now can just pick any of those to branch to, and that's not right. So I either have to do some extra work to record. So rather than just saying tags.last, I could have, I could store some other information about which of those tags on the stack are sort of correspond to a function invocation. So I could like, instead of just storing the tags, I could store a pair of the tag and a Boolean, for example. And I could say, well, every time the Boolean's true, then that's not just an enclosing block. It's actually the, it's actually the, it's actually a function body. So, it, so when we do a return, like scan through the, scan through the stack, 
don't go right to the end, but go to the first one that's marked as being a special function body one. Uh, what's Tim saying? Tim says, is there a particular tag in that tags array that tells you when to stop at a function boundary? So yeah, no, there isn't. So we could do that. But the thing that I'm tempted to do is just throw away, you know, here, essentially do self.tags equals the empty array. Because if you do that, then everything's fine, right? Because, well, obviously not everything's fine, but from the point of view of this function body, everything's fine because now it can't see anything beyond the current function activation. Like it can just say, well, just use the final tag because that must be the function body. Um, in fact, it's the one that's generated by this as block call here. Um, but this is, obviously going to be a problem after the function finishes executing. So what I actually have to do is, do I have another? No, not here, maybe in the AST parser. This kind of business, right? So I've, I've done this before where I've sort of remembered the old one. So what that looks like here is essentially I'd say like, you know, previous tags, comma, self.tags equals self.tags, comma, empty array. So that means sort of remember the old ones, reset them to be the empty array. And then at the end here, I would just say self.tags equals previous tags. So I'm sort of... I'm just wondering now whether that needs to be inside an ensure. It doesn't from the perspective of what we're doing right now because, because of this change, uh, we're never gonna, control is never gonna prematurely leave you know, this scope, um, unless an exception gets thrown, which right now it won't be, but maybe in, yeah, you know, I haven't really thought about how to model, ex how to model WebAssembly exceptions. Um, anyway, this, you know, this is the idea in principle. And the reason I said this is abusing or, or just making use of the Ruby call stack is that now I'm relying on the stack frame for this invocate, for this function, this method invocation. So when we call invoke function, we get a Ruby stack frame that's got space for local variable storage, and we use that to temp to temporarily remember what set of tags existed when we started invoking this WebAssembly function. And then that just gets remembered in the stack frame until we're ready to return from invoke function, and then we restore the previous state of the, the tag stack. And if inside the function body here, we end up invoking another function, then that will all just be repeated in a nested stack frame, a Ruby call stack frame, and we'll just get a new previous tags local that remembers the new previous version of the tag list. And then when these, when the call, when the Ruby call stack unwinds, we will, you know, repeatedly restore the old version of self.tags when we return. So, I mean, I, I think this is probably enough to make that test pass. Let's see uh, if dot wast. Oh, hold on. It's not called wasmina anymore. And it's also in, oh no, hold on. Uh, it's run dot wast now. Uh, so minus I lib run wast and then it's spec test core if. Right. So that fixes the problem. Um, so let's just let it let that run through. But I think this is this is a solution. I wonder if I do want to do something a bit like you know just to sort of extract this out into a into a helper. Um, yeah, I think I do. 
just because it will make it's a bit yeah it's, it's all a bit mixed together here I'd sort of as far as possible I'd like to have sort of composable pieces uh, that I plug together to make this stuff happen so if this is like with tags um, I don't know why I bothered copying that because I've already got all the code here um, yeah this is just using tap I think what I'd like to do is like begin yield ensure and that has the same effect in terms of well return value but I don't really care about the return value of this but I think this feels sort of conceptually more right to me. I mean, I'm, I remember I did use ensure here at one point, but it gave me a, it gave me like a gross feeling that I was doing it unnecessarily. But here I sort of, I know that, well, let's just say that in general, I, what am I trying to say? I think what I'm trying to say is, I definitely want this to happen <laughs> like and 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 I think this doesn't say that you know this the using tap here does not communicate the intent of this has to happen because it's the you know it this is the antimatter to this matter and they have to cancel each other out um see here i've also i've got a similar situation here where it's like yeah i mean here because because exceptions this is the parser exceptions in the parser will just terminate the parser maybe this is maybe this is the way to think about it in the parser there is no exception handling don't kill me kevin this this parser just craps out and stops if it finds a syntax error so it, there's no difference between doing stuff inside a tap and doing stuff inside an ensure because, like, execution is over at that point. Whereas here, I right now, I don't expect that throw is ever going to be able to... Yeah, throw should not be able to bust out of... Yeah, sorry, like, what I'm talking about is that this is, like, with tags... Well, I guess um, I should probably bake that in. Like, this is what I'm saying. Ugh. Uh, do. Ex execution should not be able to bust out of this block here. Like, this yield, right now, nothing should throw inside this that is throwing anything other than... Well, in fact, there is now there is no way for it to throw anything other than existing tags that have been generated by enclosing calls to as block so i'm not expecting anything to th any throw to terminate this block um thanks tim thanks for joining uh see you at a future one thank you um but because i'm anticipating that maybe we do want to do exception handling at some point i'm just gonna go with ensure here i don't know why i felt the need to justify that at such length um this feels right to me. Uh, let's, okay, so all of the tests passed before uh, I've broken something. Yes. Why did I copy this clearly wrong code? Oh, what am I doing? Yeah, copying that from the parser really didn't help at all, did it? Because I'd already written all of the code here. Um, Maybe this should just be like with. Yeah, I don't know. With new tags. Uh, there's no point passing in an argument here. In fact, I'm not even using the argument because I just copied this. Okay, so this is silly. Um, but what do I want to do? What do I want to call it? Maybe it should be like with fresh tags. Uh, uh, 
I'm not sure what to call this. Okay, I'm going to go back to this because I can't think of a good... I can't think of a good name. This is the best name I can think of, and this sort of really is begging for an argument, so I'm going to give it an argument. Um... So what does this mean for what the initial value of tags should be? Like, in order to reach a function body, we have to go through this, which is going to effectively initialize self.tags to be an empty array. So do I still need to do this initialization here, or can I just get rid of it? Like, can it just be initially nil? I think maybe, yeah, because it's not legitimate. I can't think of any way. Like, apart from a function definition, how can you possibly... Oh... Yeah, I'm actually not sure. The sentence I'm trying to say is making me realize that I don't actually know where expressions can appear inside a module. And, you know, my... Absent any actual knowledge about WebAssembly, my intuition would be, well, they can only appear inside function definitions, but that's probably not true. In fact, now I remember when I was writing the parser, I think there were some places where, like, arbitrary... Uh, what is it? Parse instructions is what I should be searching for because that is an expression. I think maybe there are weird places where they can appear. Uh... Oh, well, clearly in invoke and expected inside an assertion, you can put arbitrary instructions. Yeah, so this is the body of a function definition. That's what I expected. Oh, yeah, look, so this is a good example. Like, if you're declaring a global, then I think the value of that global can just be an arbitrary expression. So it's not good enough. So basically, I do have to... This does need to be ready to be used because it's not just a function definition which is going to produce this, um, which is going to initialize that to an empty array for that function. It's not just those that are going to use it. Something like a global um, might make use of this as well. So I guess I do have to leave that in. Um, let me run the test one more time. Let's make a new tab for fiddling about with Git. Oh... Uh, okay, well, I think potentially there's two, there's two separate changes here, right? So let's think about that. Okay. So I think I can do this bit, say with tags do and wrap that up um, and this isn't going to change anything about the way return works but I think this demo this should demonstrate that we can do this sort of stack discipline with the tags without messing with the ability for branches to work so branches really don't care about this. Like a branch is never going to try to branch outside of the function in which it was defined because it's it because the function definition wouldn't pass validation if you tried to do that. So this doesn't make any difference to branches, yeah, as demonstrated by the fact that those tests are passing. But this 
this gives me a way to introduce that with tags helper to sort of provide some hygiene around not making tags for blocks outside of the current function definition available to instructions inside that function definition. So I think I'm, I think I'm just going to say that. Um, so let's say, um, always execute function bodies with an empty tag stack. So let's say uh, it should be impossible for instructions within a function body to ever branch to blocks outside of that outside of that body. <laughs> um, but right now, a function call will allow the call led function to see uh, tags from the caller. We can prevent this by emptying the tag stack when we invoke a function and restore that stack once uh, the function invocation is over. This change doesn't make much sense on its own. It's preparatory work for uh, changing the way that return works or changing the implementation of return. Okay, so, yes, okay. So now, uh, drop that, restore that. Um, so yeah, so now this was the change I actually wanted to make. So this is um, implement return by throwing uh, by, let's just say, jumping directly to the function body. Oops. Okay, implement return by jumping directly to the function body. Um, And I can say uh, this is now possible because uh, with tags has arranged for tags.last to be the function, to be the body of the currently executing function, or like to necessarily be the body of the currently executing function rather than potentially uh, the body of a caller. Uh, this nicely unifies the mechanisms for branching and returning inside a function body. Great. I quite like that. I mean, I, I wasn't quite sure how this this all just flowed from that observation that, you know, that we can use catch to generate these unique tag objects. Um, but I think this is probably a significant improvement in terms of the clarity of what the heck is going on. So I'm quite pleased about that. Could we use the default tag generated by catch to jump directly to the correct block instead of rethrowing? Yeah, I mean, I never even... I didn't even read this out, but I wrote this previously, so I remembered what it said. So yeah, jump directly to the correct block instead of rethrowing. Bonus, unify branch and return. So I think we've done that now. Um, here, we should find a healthy balance between using Ruby's call stack and maintaining our concrete one. 
Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm doing that here. I mean, the thing is, I don't need, I don't have to use Ruby's call stack here. I could, tags could be like an array of arrays. Um, so we could maintain a stack of, I mean, effectively at this point, it turns into a call stack, really. You know, it'd be like a stack of activation records. At the moment, each activation record would just consist of the tags for the for the blocks that were inside for each currently activated function invocation. Um, and then we push and pop that stack explicitly rather than here. It's sort of, it's implicit that when with tags returns, we're sort of popping this, you know, the, the value that was stored in this local variable is now being restored to the state of the interpreter. So the these values are sort of moving in and out of the Ruby call stack rather than in and out of a data structure that we've explicitly created. So is the balance here healthy? I think it's probably fine for now. I suspect that this is going to become unwieldy if and when we need more information in the activation records because right now you know, this is essentially part of the activation record of whatever function is being invoked here. And it's just hidden away in the Ruby call stack right now. Um, it might need to be reified somewhat. And like I said, you know, maybe we need to have a sort of an explicit stack of activation records, which would include these tags, but also other information about the currently executing function. Um, but right now, this is the only information that we need about the currently executing function. So I'm sort of comfortable with it hiding away in the Ruby call stack like this. But it's something for me to think about and remember. Um, what am I going to do about that? Let's just say, um, let's just add a to-do here. Uh, if we ever need to store more information about the currently executing function than just the list of tags, we might need an explicit data structure to store activation records instead of hiding uh, previous tags. Not hiding, but keeping previous tags in the Ruby call stack. So uh, if I don't know if I'll ever see that to-do list item again, but at least that's kind of a reminder. Uh, Chris says storing function name would be rad. Could mean you could have nicer stack traces. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Right, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything, I don't have anything approximating a useful call stack right now, uh, stack trace right now. So that's a really good point, yeah. If I did have, if I always had the current stack of activation records, then yeah, if there was an exception or I guess by the time an assertion failed, it'd be too late because that, because the function execution is over by that point. But yeah, I can, yeah, function name is a really good idea. Like that's exactly the kind of thing that I might want to be able to keep track of, you know, to be able to trace that at the moment we're inside of the execution of function D, whose caller was function C, whose caller was function B, whose caller was function A, and we just don't have any of that information at the moment. Hmm. Well, I will think about that and see if I can... Yeah, I mean, right now... We don't have, like I say, the only time we get a stack trace, or the only time we get a failure is when an assertion's failed. So we wouldn't see a useful stack trace at the moment, but maybe once I implement exceptions, that would be a really good point at which, you know, to make it possible to get a usable backtrace out of, out of a function execution rather than just the Ruby sort of stack trace that we get by default. Um, oh, and this is, again, in a sort of, Zeturian area I've said can we use loop to avoid tap and redo so I think this was 
Yeah, I was thinking about this. Because this confused me before. I mean, I realized I haven't... I said I was going to try and take a look at implementing a new feature, and I haven't even started it yet. I'm still working off my backlog of stuff that occurred to me since last time, so I'm sorry that we're down this recursive rabbit hole. But this tap really does bother me. In the abstract, it bothers me, because it's unnecessary. The only reason this is here is to induce a block here so that we can redo it. And it's sort of a quirk of Ruby, or at least a quirk of my knowledge of Ruby, that I don't know any better way of doing it than this. But actually, now that this condition has been simplified, I think this becomes quite a lot clearer that, like... This is now, syntactically, the last thing that we do inside this block. And the thing that we are doing is doing the block again. So, yeah, like I was saying, I got confused about this before because I sort of forgot that this tap was here and that, you know, redo is kind of unusual. Like, firstly, what's the difference, the difference between redo and next here? Probably nothing. Um, so that's confusing. And then, yeah, I, you know, because my head wasn't working properly, I sort of forgot where redo was actually, like, what redo was actually going to redo. And I think I thought that it was going to somehow redo this block, but it doesn't. It goes, it redoes this one. And so, overall, I feel like there's a fair amount of, my brain contains a fair amount of confusion about this. And so, the reason I wrote this here is, like, can we just make this a loop instead? Like, literally, could this just be loop do? And then instead of redoing, we sort of do the opposite. We sort of say, mm, well, it's not, the opposite is not break unless redo on branch, because this, uh, this is inside this conditional. So hold on, let me just think about what the opposite is. The opposite is, well, we could do that here and then we would also need an else branch. But I think probably what we should, it would be something like, hold on, this was redo if redo on branch. I think this was probably something like, oh, I hate stuff like this. Break unless, so stop the loop you know, on its first iteration, stop it by default. By default, stop. Because we, we don't actually want to use this loop. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Chris says, this is the head-spinning reason why I suggested redo. But I do think, well, let's just see where this... I do think this is a bit less bad, actually, because... Uh, I'm, I'm I'm now trying to remember, like, what was it like at the beginning? Let me, let me, because what I don't want to do is go backwards. Um, and yeah, Chris, if this was the thing that you were trying to get me away from with your suggestion in the first place, I don't want to go back to it. Oh, yeah, see, this is what you were saying. They exit by default and only repeat if you branch to them within the loop. crap yeah this is just basically undoing your suggestion isn't it <sighs> although yeah i mean it is but i suppose the difference is that now we've unified 
block and if and loop, right? So now we've got this sort of unified notion of executing a block. Yeah, I really hate to I really hate to go backwards on this because it was definitely an improvement putting that redo in. It's just the tap that I hate. What was it that you If there's an exit by default version of loop you can make, it might be cleaner if abstracted. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's I'm just going to see where this goes <laughs> and see how I feel about it. Because I, I was sort of on the brink of writing this condition here. So I think this is break unless we branched. And also we redo on branch. Yeah, I could use then rather than tap. Yeah. I really hate the feeling of just because I it definitely was an improvement putting this redo in and, and now I'm now I'm worried that I'm just going back to this going back to something that's harder to understand. Oh yeah, I remember now you had to yeah, your version of this, Chris, was using define method. Seems like you always sort of have to do something weird to make redo work like this is the real achilles heel, heel of redo <laughs> is that like it's designed it's designed basically to work inside a loop right and so you have to do something to make it feel like it's inside a block it's a shame we can't just do hold on i was gonna say it's a shame we can't just do begin Okay, hold on, like, just humor me a minute here, because, yeah, uh, Chris says you could, the alternative is use an exception and retry. See, I think, okay, you're, you'll say this is, you know, special pleading, um, and that what I'm doing is wrong. Maybe you won't. Okay, what I was... I was just thinking out loud, right, about how it's annoying that redo doesn't let you use begin. You know, because ordinarily, that's how you would want to just make an arbitrary block, right? Sort of say, well, I just... I just here's Here are some lines of code. I just want to put begin end around them. That's my... That's my block, essentially. But because it's not syntactically a block in Ruby, you can't use redo inside it. But but this is now looking at this code. Well, firstly, let's let me just let me just set start the test running so I can at least know whether this is working. Looking at this code, I think this is now basically equivalent to having, like now that this break is right at the end, then I think we could rewrite this as a begin end block. And this could just be a, a sort of a post fix while. So this could be begin, all of this stuff, end, well, whether it be while or until, I guess, is another... You have to work out the kind of De Morgan's laws of getting that working correctly. Okay, so that's okay. Um, yeah, let me just illustrate where I was going with that. Was that if this was just a begin, like now that this is just a condition right at the end, then I don't see why this couldn't be like while branched and redo on branch. So now this becomes part of the loop condition, essentially. 
rather than being in a break here and I do just get to wrap effectively I do just get to declare a block that corresponds to the WebAssembly block so this is my kind of Ruby version of the WebAssembly block and ultimately is just yielding in the middle here and then this is the mechanism that allows us to redo it as many times as necessary if that's appropriate I'm now starting to think about how we could decompose this because because this is all unnecessary in the case where redo on branch is false, right? <laughs> like if redo on branch is false, then we never need to do any of this business. So it's a little bit and that's the that's the usual case. It's only in the specific case of loops that we need to worry about any of this stuff. So I sort of wonder whether this body here could sort of be sort of extracted and then, you know, achieve the dream of getting rid of this flipping Boolean parameter that no one likes. Um, okay, let me... Let me see whether this works. I do feel like I'm kind of getting somewhere here. Okay, let's see what the tests say. I think this is gradually getting more tractable. In fact, looking at this, I think the... So we got rid of that stuff in invoke function about having a local variable called returned that was keeping track of this Boolean. I feel like we could do this branch thing a little bit tidier as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to tidy that up as well. Um, See, look, if this was if this was pulled out into some kind of helper, is it the same as do while? What happens if I do that? No, see, that's not a thing. You know, you... I'm not sure what you mean, Chris, but that's, you know, you're not allowed to do that. You know, I guess it would have to be that, wouldn't it? <laughs> Maybe that's what you meant. Oh. Right, well, that doesn't work because now, yeah, okay, I guess this was, the reason this was working before is because there's no longer a block here, so this branched local variable, yeah, you could, you could be thinking of something that's not Ruby, but this local variable is now no longer visible at this point because it's it's in a it's inside a block right so the the lexical scope of this local variable is not visible to the condition here whereas when i made this a begin that allows yeah you know, that's in that's in the the lexical scope of this is the body of this method and so the condition is able to see it here um Which, yeah, makes me realize that I could move these around a bit. Oh, hold on. I've just realized that I'm not using result here at all anymore. I, I missed that. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a far more obvious thing to change. <laughs> um, I should have removed that before. Uh, in fact, I'd be tempted to fix up the commit where I forgot to do that. Um, where did I forget to do that? Uh, it was here. 
Yeah, so this thing that was... This cared about the result of this block because it needed the number, but now this result is completely meaningless. So I think I'm, I'm just going to fix that up because... Because nobody needs to nobody needs a commit that leaves that hanging around like a bad smell. Um, yeah, that was that was part of the previous change, and I just forgot to include it, and I just didn't notice until now. So yeah, this is all one way or another. This is all sort of progressively getting getting cleaned up. Do I want to fix up that commit? Do I? I've changed my mind. Um, remove unused result local from as block. And then I can just say Um, let's say this has been unused since blah removed the uh, payload of uh, yeah the payload of the throne symbol uh, I just didn't notice it was no longer needed until now. I suppose my motivation for doing that was just a sort of... Oh, hello, Simon. Simon Coffee is here. Hi. Uh, does that also mean you don't need to yield tap branched equals false bit and you can just yield branched equals false because you're not using the return value of yield now? Um... That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, was I ever using the return of value of yield? I don't know that I was. So, I think perhaps that whole thing might be a bit of a might be a bit of unnecessary mess, basically. <laughs> um, let's see how far we can get with cleaning this up. So, hold on, what done I do here? Of course, what I'm trying to do is, I, I don't want to commit any of this if I if I'm just going to change my mind about it, because... I don't want I don't want to go backwards like this was definitely an improvement using redo here was really nice but I think I'm starting to convince myself that if it was possible to extract this bit and then just be able to write a line of code that's like do the block body while branched basically so like arrange for the evaluation of this thing to tell me whether it branched or not. And if it did, I just want to keep doing it. I think that that's ultimately going to be the easiest thing to understand. To be able to say, like, evaluate loop body while branched. Um, or evaluate block body while branched is going to be a nice... I'm imagining that there's going to be a sort of as loop or something that does that. And it feels like we're moving towards that here, and that feels like a better situation than I'm than I'm currently in here. Um, oh God, the order in which I've done things has made this rather difficult. Um, Uh, 
Okay, so look, I'm gonna... I'm gonna take this a step at a time. And then, yeah, then I'm gonna think about what's going on inside the catch here, because I think Simon's right about this. I mean, I... I yeah, no one... This, the, the result of this yield is just going nowhere now. At least previously, I had the... There was the possibility of it being used for something, but now it is just being thrown away. So, yeah, the, the tap here, I think, is... I think you're quite right, Simon, that that's completely unnecessary now. Um, yeah, I think I am going to... I'm going to... Chris, I'm going to risk your wrath here by pushing forward with this in the hope that it gets us to a happy conclusion. <laughs> and I may well live to regret this and you'll just have to berate me at the next opportunity if, the, if I turn out to be wrong about this. But I just want to pursue this. And if I end up reverting it, then that will be my punishment. Um, so what am I doing here? This is... I'm, I, the reason I've gone back to this loop is because I'm trying to take this a step at a time because it was the existence of this condition right at the end that made me realise that I could drop the loop here. Um, so let's just say use loop and, well, loop break instead of tap redo uh, in as block. So what do I want to say about this? Um, although this uh, is to some extent undoing the good work of number two, who does number two work for? Uh, I'm hopeful that it will well, let's say I notice that it puts the loop termination condition syntactically right at the end of the loop, which should make it possible for us to move that condition outside of the loop altogether, which is hopefully clearer than the current redo situation. I don't feel particularly confident about this and can only hope that Zeta will forgive me if I turn out to be wrong. Ah, no, Chris is rooting for me. I think it would be great if you could separate the block and backward jump concerns. Okay, well then, that's fine. Um, I won't put that in the commit message. I will just allow this to stand alone. Uh, let's just say, um, to be honest, my main motivation is to just get rid of the unnecessary uh, tap, which upset me. Let's be honest about my real motivations here. Just pure emotion <laughs> rather than anything rational. Okay, so yes. And then my next step was moving that there. And let me just confirm that that's fine. So this would be use um, begin while instead of loop and break in as block. Let's just check that this is okay. Yeah, this is okay. Um, so let's just say we're now able to move the termination condition outside of the loop body entirely, which creates the tantalizing possibility 
of being able to separate these two concerns. Um, I do miss the redo. Um, but ultimately, I'm hopeful that this is going to be clearer in the end. We shall see. Just create a bit of jeopardy. Um, that's how you keep programming exciting, isn't it? Just constant introduction of jeopardy. Um, so, yes, what would happen Well, yeah, firstly, I think I can get rid of the, I think I can get rid of the tap. Um, it would actually be a lot nicer if I could just move branch equals to true inside that block, but I think that's not going to work from a lexical scope perspective. Um, although I could just declare it at the top and then have this be referring to a local from... Uh, from an enclosing scope. So maybe that's the way to go. Okay, it seems I haven't broken it yet. So why don't we see if we can get away with like this basically. Like this, this is the, it's unfortunate that I have to do this in the first place, but it feels like sandwiching the yield between set this flag to true and then set this flag to false is again, like, I think having this locality here is clearer than having it be sort of lopsided like that. So I think if I could get away with this, it would be better, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to do like a branched equals nil or whatever at the top here to make that work out syntactically. Let's just check that. Yeah, okay. That didn't take long to go wrong. So in principle, what would be the change here? I mean, this is just sort of generally cleaning up the branched equals true and branched equals false, right? It's like, I, c I could separate these changes. Um, and perhaps I will. Just because that'll make it easier on the, easier on the diff reading, I think. Um, so this is just the coffee maneuver, you know, this is just get rid of the, get rid of the tap. Uh, so let's say, uh, yeah, remove unnecessary, unnecessary. Uh, tap in as block. Um, yes, okay, that's all good. Uh, I'll say uh, as Urban or Tom Maton points out, let me just check that I've got your username right, Simon. I do. I recognize that cheerful little robot. As Urban Automaton points out, uh, now that we're no longer assigning uh, the result of cache to anything, uh, it doesn't matter what the block returns. Let's, let's introduce a fancy colon here. As Urban Automaton points out, now that we're no longer assigning the result of cache or anything, it doesn't matter what the block returns. So there's really no benefit in using tap to preserve the result of yield. Uh, let's get rid. Okay, and now, yes, again, I think this is, I think it's easier to see what's happened here. 
Um, let's say, I'm just going to be paranoid and run the test again. But let's say something like move uh, initial, or oh, move uh, setup of branched flag inside catch block in as block. Uh, let's say uh, sandwiching the yield between uh, branched equals true and branched equals false. Hopefully, makes it a little clearer what is going on here. Let's make this directly between. Um, the downside is that uh, the branched local variable uh, needs to be declared, for want of a better word, even though Ruby doesn't really have this, it needs to be declared um, in the outer scope so that the catch block can mutate its value. Uh, and in a way that is visible to the loop condition. Okay. So yes, is there is there an obvious way? I mean, I'm really I'm. I've gone. I've strayed so far from what I was originally intending to do here that it's become slightly. I mean, yes, the answer here is yes. We can use a loop to avoid tap and redo. Um, but I've I've strayed so far from my original intention here that it's become slightly absurd. Um, but but nonetheless. What's the end game here? I think, yeah, what I was going for was the ability to somehow extract this. You know, this was just going to be a foo. I guess I don't need begin end anymore. This is just my foo. Oh, I did actually need that end. Um... And then this was, I was just going to happily foo while branched and redo on branch. Uh, I think I'm not quite done. Um, foo is clearly going to need some information and it's also going to need to return something. Um, well, I guess it's just going to return branched. Um, this is obviously a little all a bit grim. Um, clearly, yield here is going to have to do something. Um, so let's give this an anonymous block parameter and then pass that on when we call foo. What else does this need? Oh, it needs the branch arity. Oh. Oh. Okay, well, obviously, this is becoming a little bit less appealing as time goes on. And it also needs the stack height. Oh, dear. Um, it's not brilliant, is it? I've I've done brillianter things in my life than that. Um, I mean the branch arity. 
well i i don't i was going to say this can be computed from the type of the of the block but i i don't want to push that into foo because the whole point of what i'm doing here is to try and make foo jump direction agnostic and this is specifically a jump direction concern so i want to keep this outside and stack height you can't really compute inside here because you have to do it the once at the beginning whereas the whole point of foo is that it's the thing that's repeated in the case of in the case of the loop so this might okay hold on i've gone very wrong um unhandled exception uh <laughs> what have i done have i have i done something very silly oh well that exception is going to be a piece of sort of stack Raise unless expected length equals actual values length. Oh, I suspect. If I suspect if I say raise foo unless actual values length is equal to type results dot length, I think probably that we're gonna get that going wrong. Yeah. Boo. Okay, um, so yeah, it's a little bit frustrating that stack.pop will happily return fewer objects than expected. So the, the stack is empty here, or the stack doesn't have enough stuff on it. So I've done something stupid. Um, Uh, does this need to be, does this assignment need to happen? I'm just... What have I not thought about here? So, th this is sort of like a classic, you know, extract method situation, right? Oh, hold on. No. It's maybe branched is the problem. Is that the problem? That again, I, I've just recreated this. Yeah, I've recreated this situation where branch is confined to this block, and so there it's therefore it's always going to be nil there. Yes. Okay. Well, I won't run all of that. Let me let me think about. Okay. So I've at least I've stopped madly moving stuff around without knowing. <laughs> Uh, what is going on? Um, okay, so now can I get away? Can I get away with simply this? Syntactically, no. Same problem again. Is it operator precedence? No. So does that really need to be inside a block like that? That's rather surprising. Uh, but at least I can get rid of that. Okay, so we still good? Okay, so we are getting somewhere here, aren't we? Because now it's feeling much more like I can have two different versions of this method, which previously I was loath to do because it would have involved repeating all of this code. But now it feels like I've got something more fundamental here, which is... goodness knows what I call this but this is the this is the thing that will 
once you know this is the thing that will do the that will do the stack unwinding basically I mean, maybe I could call this with branch handler because essentially that's what it is. It's it's catching, it sets up the branch handler by manufacturing a unique tag, sticking it on the tag stack, yielding to the block, detecting whether it's thrown that specific tag. And then if it has thrown that specific tag, it does the stack unwinding. And then it tells you whether it did that. Um, I'm just thinking about the stack height and branch arity situation. Um, okay, so that's all working. I think I'm going to rename branch arity to just arity. And I think I'm going to rename branch values to just values. Um, because th this is going to be... I can't think of a better name for it than this. Um... I'm just pausing to think about the what what if I can do any better with the stack height stuff. Because this can always be uh Maybe I'll think about this separately. Um, I'm very tempted to believe that it's possible to push this into this. And I think maybe I will in a minute. <laughs> um, so for now, let's just make this stack height, arity, branch arity. So I'll make these keyword arguments the reason I think it's okay to push stack height into with branch handler is that the first time we enter it the because you know the problem is it needs to measure the stack height right the the original stack height and so the first time we enter this it can do that because the stack has has been unaffected. We haven't run the block yet. Um, however, what I would say is that uh, what would I say if we do it again? Then the only way we can do it again is if we've restored the original <laughs> stack height, right? So either this this only runs once because we're not inside a loop, in which case it really doesn't matter whether this code is here or here, because it's the same. Um, or in the case where this is going to run multiple times, we know that the second and the third and the fourth time that it runs the branch handler will have restored the original height of the stack. And I mean, I this is how it worked to begin with accidentally. And I changed it to compute this once at the beginning because it was clearer. But
I do think there's something to be said for just passing the type into this block rather than the stack height. So let's see. Everything's working at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the, the point of all of this faffing about is to be able to get rid of this <laughs> cursed argument, right? What I want is to be able to define as loop. Um, and it feels like we're tantalizingly close to being able to do that. But for now, I think I can justify this as just a straightforward method extraction. Yeah. I can say extract with branch handler from as block and say this is the code this is the this is the part of the block handling code which will be executed either once in the case of a normal block or perhaps multiple times in the case of a loop uh, depending on what type of block this is what type of block we're executing by extracting this I'm hoping I can split the as block helper into two separate ones dedicated to the two type kinds of block let's not say type uh thereby eliminating the cursed redo on branch parameter specifically that this the fact that it's a boolean parameter that's problematic Um, and I haven't said anything about the stack height thing, but let's just see what that looks like. If I push stack height into here, because then that's, okay, my motivation for doing this is because if I'm going to duplicate this method, that's one less thing for me to be doing in the duplicated method. It's being pushed down into this with branch handler, right? So this just becomes type, type. Okay, does that work? Like I said, it's slightly subtle to understand why this works, but I think it all fits together like a little conceptual jigsaw. He says confidently. I mean, basically, if it works, then who cares? That's the that's the view from apathy. Uh, yes, okay. Um fine. So I was just think I just got slightly distracted thinking about whether we can do any better with that branch local variable, but I think I'm just gonna let it be for now. Um, so this is uh, move stack. Let's say, uh, well, yeah, move stack height measurement into with branch handler. So let's say uh, the cost of this. Um, let's just say this this happens to work fine because either the block is executed only once in which case it doesn't matter uh, where we measure the initial stack depth or it's executed multiple times I don't know why I'm parenthesizing this. It's not really appropriate. Or it's executed multiple times, in which case 
the branch handler, which is what must have caused it to execute multiple times, has restored the stack to its original height. Uh, let's say, uh, let's reword this. This happens to work fine because either this is the first time the block has executed, uh, in which case it doesn't matter where we, it doesn't matter in which method we measure the initial stack depth, or it's, um, not the first time it's executed, in which case the branch handler from the previous iteration, which is what must have caused uh, it to execute again, has already has already restored the stack to its original height. Um, this is slightly subtle and potentially harder to understand than the previous setup where we only ever measured the stack height once at the beginning. Uh, but I think it's worth doing it this way in order to minimize the amount of setup code in as block, which we'd like to duplicate, or which we'd like to split out into an accompanying as loop method. Overall, I hope it's a net win for comprehensibility of this code, even if this specific step is a little hard to justify in isolation. <sighs> That's just rubbish, isn't it? I'm just, I'm just making stuff up at this point, um, but so be it. Uh, so, Um, am I ready? I think that I am. I think I can split this now and call it as loop. And then when I call as block, Hold on. Oh, yeah, okay. Crap. I don't call as, I was, I was hoping I was calling as block here, but I'm not, I'm calling evaluate block. Oh. You know, I wanted this to be as loop. Um, expand block type. Type locals, this is body. <sighs> That's annoying. I mean, arguably, I could have an evaluate loop helper as well, but it's starting to get a bit silly. Um, so this do, this thing doesn't need uh, redo on branch. Uh, because 
it always does. So the arity here, we can just inline type parameters length. Uh, that wasn't right. And it needs a block parameter. So does that work? Because that is my attempt to specialize as block just for loops. And then we can remove all the loop related gubbins from as block, which I think is just going to boil down to a call to with branch handler providing the correct arity. Okay. I feel like there must be some value in what I'm doing here, even though it's... This isn't amazing, is it? I mean, I don't know. I feel like we've... I feel like we've isolated the, the nature of the loop here. In fact, I mean, if <laughs> now it feels like having this as a post condition is um, maybe less useful. Like, would it be better if this was loop now? You know, something like that. Or could it even be like while branched? I mean, that, that was ultimately what I was doing here. I think maybe being able to say while is an advantage there. even though I'm not saying loop. Um, let's say um, uh, duplicate, or let's say make specialized uh, as block, make a specialized <laughs> version Uh, I prefer, uh, Chris is saying, I prefer while as it avoids conflating Ruby loops with WASM loops. Okay. So you're saying you prefer the way that I've got it now? You prefer the fact that it doesn't have a, you know, loop do at the beginning of the method? You think it's a little clearer the way that it is right now? I think you might be a, you might be a minute behind. So I'll keep going, but I will look out for your answer to that question. Um, make a specialized version of as block, uh, for loops. Ah, yes, okay, okay, just for loops. Um, this new as loop method does the same thing as, as block, but without the uh, redo on branch parameter. It always, it assumes we always want to redo on branch. This allows us to inline the value of, what was it, branch arity. Yes. Um, okay, and then 
this is the ultimate point is that we can just get rid of this so we again we can well the beauty here is that we can inline this remove this entirely and also get rid of the begin and the end and get rid of branched and just do this so this is just gonna as block is just a particular like now the conditional is which of these methods do you call and either we use the result type of the block or we use the parameter type of the block we choose the right one and and that goes along with either we sit inside a loop here or we just call it the ones so now I just need to get rid of these awful redo on branches. Okay, well, I don't know why I'm looking at the diff when I haven't run the tests. It's irrelevant, isn't it? Okay, it's looking hopeful. And I definitely wasn't intending to spend two and a half hours on faffing about with this, but this has been really bugging me for a while and and it feels good to have I feel like I finally got a grip on it. And ultimately, I think this was a good reason to liberate then this wasn't why I did it, but it, the retcon here is, oh, it's good that I have with branch handler available because actually I can use that as a building block for these two different implementations okay so I think this is just remove redo or like specialize as you know yeah Yeah. Fundamentally, it's about removing this. Remove redo on branch parameter from as block. Um, we now only call as block with false. Uh, well, with redo on branch false. So we can just remove the parameter and in line again is it just yeah in line the value of branch arity um this also allows us to remove the while ceremony from as block since it will never be used well since it was never used when redo on branch was false okay that's pretty good um i don't think that this evaluate block is pulling its weight anymore because I I still have to call as block here inside invoke function. So as block is not really a sort of implementation detail that nobody else uses. It is actually needed in invoke function. Like it's not enough to have a helper that just evaluates some expression because in this case we have to do something else you know the body of the block is not just the function body it's also the calling convention for retrieving the function arguments so i think probably 
Yeah, there are only two callers for evaluate block now. Now that I'm not, I can't use it in loop anymore because I don't want to call as block inside loop. I want to call as loop. I think that was the nail in the coffin. Like, I just don't want to do it. I want to do it. I, I, I'll do it here. So this just becomes evaluate expression body. And this just becomes evaluate expression body. And then I just get rid of this. I mean, that does immediately make me think, could we push expand block type into as block? No, for this reason, I remember now. What does expand block type do? current module types slice oh, maybe we could maybe we could get away with it because the whole point of expand block type is that it supports yeah I talked about this before that's not really what it's for the idea of expand block type is that you have to provide it either an index or this sort of weird special case where you only have an array of result types. And I think it would be an abuse of that to use it in this situation. <laughs> Chris suggesting expand add a new argument uh, a boolean argument called expand block type to tell it whether to expand the block type or not I'm not going to do that Chris <laughs> um, because if I pass the function type index here maybe that's okay Maybe that's okay. Maybe I'm being too much of a prude. What it would mean is that if I pass this in and it gets passed to expand type, then it will create the possibility, it would create the ability for it to still work if this is not actually an index, but in a, an array of result types, which is not what was intended. But... This is always an index. It's called type index. So it's definitely in the domain of expand block type. So it will always be safe to pass function type index in as the type here. Doesn't matter. I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it as it is for now. And then if this repetition of expand block type really starts to upset me then I'll think about that separately. But I think this change is good because evaluate block, when I introduced it, it was the way to execute a block. And now it is no longer the way to execute a block. It is just one of several ways of doing it. And I think it just, there's, now there are only two ways, two places that actually execute a block like this. And so I think it's just ceased to be helpful. Um, and I can complain in the commit message about expand block type um, uh, let's say uh, inline the now unnecessary I'm really I'm having real trouble typing unnecessary today I don't know why I, I I think I do know how to spell it, um, but just not repeatably and on demand. Inline the now unnecessary evaluate block helper. Um, when I introduced this, it was the only way to evaluate a block, but now it's just one of several ways, e.g., uh, 
as loop. Uh, uh, and the usage of, uh, well, let's say, and the different usage of the as block method inside invoke function. And in fact, is only used twice. So it's no longer particularly special and doesn't deserve um, <laughs> and therefore doesn't deserve to exist. Harsh but fair. Uh, and yes, I'll add a whinge. Um, I was extremely tempted to push the call to expand block type inside the oh, as block method since it looks like we're always is that true well i guess it would actually be inside with block handler right or with branch handler Yeah, inside the with branch handler method, since it looks like we're always doing it, but that's not quite true. In invoke function, we don't want the option of passing in an array of result types only a type index. This is quite pedantic, but it doesn't feel like a significant enough gain to uh, do the expand block type call somewhere else if that isn't strictly correct. So I'm going to chicken out of it for now. All right, I think, oh, and this complaint I had about naming of is block and evaluate block, I can, and with branch handler, I think I've wrung all of the, all of the joy out of that particular decision. So I think I'm I think I've finished faffing about with this branch handling this block handling code. I finally got rid of that parameter. Um I've separated out the sort of looping from the you know body evaluating concern. Um I think I'm finally free from having to deal with this. So, yeah, everything's fine, isn't it? Um, I'll just clean up this as I let the tests run in celebration. Um, this is all over with. No one cares about this anymore. Um, I, changed, I decided not to do that. Um, this is some identifier context nonsense. Uh, yes, I did that. I did that. I introduced a nice module object. Yeah, I did that in parse elements. Okay. Uh, I guessed wasm spec path is present. Um, memory is no longer an instance variable. Okay, I'm not gonna, it's very tempting. There, there are lots of attractive nuisances down here um, that I accidentally started looking at, but I'm not going to look at them, even though they're very tempting. Okay, so now, three hours in, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. Having finally discharged the responsibility of dealing with the, the sort of nerd snipe that I left at the top here for myself, um, 
is think about adding some new language feature to make some of these tests pass. Um, although, yeah, I did have these mystery... Oh. Yeah, I forgot about this. I have these mystery test failures. Um, like, it parses it fine, but it doesn't work. I32 add assertion is failing. Oh no. Oh, and also align.last needs proper align support. Well, look. Oh. Oh, that's very broken. Somehow a byte is telling it to be nil there. Um, I think I should probably fix the things that I know are broken rather than, oh, this test isn't passing because it requires some feature I haven't implemented yet. Like, I've got these tests that probably should be passing, but they're not. And it feels like I don't really have any choice but to address those. Um, let me just check. These are all... So, memory grow. Oh, yeah, this is the one that's really slow. Um memory size yeah okay damn okay um i think i'd better look at some of these let's look at left to right and then i can legitimately say that i've added a new language feature because obviously it's not doing something that it's supposed to be doing here um it's just not quite as exotic as implementing a bit of syntax that I didn't even know how to parse before. Um, so the very, it looks like the very first assertion is failing here. I32 add. So for, let me understand this. Why is this called left to right? We reset the memory, then the instruction calls something left, something right, something another, something callee, and something bool. These functions all call bump, which shifts the memory starting address A up a byte and then stores a unique value at address A. Then we read the four byte value at address A. It should contain the correct sequence of unique values if the calls were evaluated in the correct order. So this is some kind of, I'm not sure I understand what this is testing. But, I mean, it's clearly exercising <sighs> memory loads in stores. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand whether that's what it's... Whether that's really what it's intending to test. Yeah, I'm sorry. I feel like I should understand what the point of this is. Let's look at the history of this and see if I can... What was this introduced for? Really, I just want to look for when it was introduced. Added left to right tests. This test is from testing do testing to do. It tests if all arithmetic instructions evaluate their operands from left to right. Okay. Well, that's a bit more interesting. Tests that arithmetic operands are evaluated left to right. The arithmetic instruction calls something underscore left and something underscore right. Okay, so we're adding... Oh, I see. Okay, right. Okay. Right. <laughs> so the idea is that I32 left and I32 right have a side effect on the contents of memory. So it's able to detect what order these two 
you know, is, is I-32 left called first or is I-32 right called first? And if they're called in the wrong order, then the test will fail. Okay, okay. I should have understood that from left to right, but I didn't. Actually, the reason why I didn't understand that is because it was making me think of right to left, you know, like, the, you know, text f flow direction. Um, and for some reason, I just wasn't thinking of the much more obvious interpretation, which is... Well, this is a, it's a little harder to see that this is what it's doing, but no, no, I was just looking the wrong place. Okay. It's basically the same code. Okay, cool. So the idea is that we add, yeah, we do this addition whose result is discarded. So we don't care about the result of the addition. We just, we reset the contents of memory. We do the addition, we throw away its result, and then we call this get function that's going to pull a specific byte out of memory, the four byte value at address eight, which is what this is. And then that will tell us whether these were called in the correct order. So we're not getting the right answer. Expected 258 got two. I32 add. So these are all, these all just return 0102. But we got two. So I suspect that what's going on here, well, if we if if you take a look at two five eight, um, and two. Oh, how do I? Um, oh, um, yes, I don't know why I did. Just wasn't thinking. Um, you can see that they're basically the same value. It's just that one of them doesn't have this bit set up here. So I think what's going on is that we're probably, I think it is evaluating these things in the right order, but I also think it's overwriting something because I haven't properly implemented these narrow store instructions. You know, I think when it's doing store eight, um, I assume this is the address and this is the value. Uh, I'm afraid it's just overwriting the, in, you know, it's not storing a single byte, it's storing a 32-bit value. So I think it's just clobbering whatever was, whatever's in the higher byte, which is ultimately we read out four bytes here um, at position eight. So I think think that to make this pass I just have to implement store n properly which I think is what I put here yeah maybe store 8 store 16 um, I'm not even remembering the storage size when we pass that so so here with load well, I'm just going to copy this. Storage size equals, if there's a number in there, oh no, hold on. Okay, yeah, so what we do is we say we always slice it, we slice it out. If it's not there, then we just default to 32 if it was i32, and we default to 64 if it was i64. Um, otherwise, we treat that as a base 10 number. Okay, yeah, so that's the same thing. And we don't need assign extension mode because it doesn't make sense in the context of store. With load, we because we're going to be extending that value from 8 or 16 bits to potentially 32 or 64 bits, we need to know whether it's supposed to be assigned number or not so that we can make it a signed number of the correct width, which involves doing the whole twos complement, making sure the sign bit's set and all that kind of stuff. But for storage, we don't care about any of that. We're just literally going to take, well, I guess that what we do is we just mask off the bottom eight bits, the bottom 16 bits, the bottom 32 bits, and only store those. 
regardless of whether that number is supposed to be interpreted as signed or unsigned it's it's just irrelevant um and i think that makes sense uh because with the load what we're doing is retrieving from memory an 8-bit number or a 16-bit number and sort of expanding it to be 32 bits long so that it fits in a standard type whereas this way around we're saying we're starting with a 32-bit or a 64-bit number depending on whether it's an i32 or an i64 and then we're just squishing it down to store only one byte or two bytes or potentially four bytes of that four byte or eight byte number in memory and there's no you can't take an eight byte signed number and somehow squish it down into one byte like that's just not meaningful i mean unless it's unless it's in a very narrow range of magnitudes in general that's not a meaningful operation so i think the only meaningful operation here is to hell with what it's supposed to represent we're just going to slice out these 8 bits or these 16 bits or these 32 bits and to hell with I assume it's the least significant bytes that we're talking about here but that seems like something I'm going to need to know to make this work properly <laughs> so in fact is it possible for me to reason about that let me get the parser working and then I'll think about what the interpreter needs to do so this is going to need to hold on to the storage size and we're going to need in the AST to give it a storage size. Oops. Um, so that should all be fine. I think that's a self-contained change. What did I say last time? Oh, in fact, this is in uh, oh, it's in parse numeric instruction. Oh, yeah, well, that's not what I wanted to see. Um, Right, but that was th this commit message does not say, oh yeah, okay, so I'm just going to do this for store instruction AST node. I'm always happy to avoid writing a commit message if I can. Well, you know, authoring one from scratch. So store, storage size, and site, uh, well, store storage size in store instruction AST node that's important information and yeah there's a bit of you know this is this is one of the this is the kind of thing that i'm going to come back to and do some refactoring later so that i'm not duplicating this code all over the place but for now i'm happy to just let that go um so presumably that hasn't uh what was it left to right um Yeah, that hasn't improved the situation. I realize now I should have added that to the pending test, but I'm hoping this is going to be a quick one. Um, so for load, I think everything, memory is little endian, isn't it? So I think we tend to always start with the least significant byte so I would, we'll find out if this is true, but my prejudice would be that store, if I say store 8 of an i32, I'd imagine that that's only going to store the least significant byte. Yeah, because that's, 
ultimately what this ends up doing, right? If we say the storage size is, well, let's have a look. Oh, it's, is it in its separate file? No. Oh, it should be really. You know, if you say, if we're loading two bytes here, so it was 16 bits, we would just load. We start at the offset. And then we just add on however many bytes we've read. So for the first byte, we're adding on zero. And then for the second byte, we're adding on one. So I think the same situation should probably apply for writing. Here, we're just passing through the appropriate number of bits. I mean, is this just going to, you know, I did some hand wringing there, but can I just pass through storage size here? And like, we don't care about the, you know, we don't care that it's an I-32 or, or an I-64 or whatever. Like, we're literally just trusting that the storage size is going to give us the right value. And again, I assume with store here, we're doing the same thing where it's like we... Yeah, if it's if, if it was only eight bits, then we would only iterate this loop one time and index here would be zero. Um, so I think that's all okay. In fact, I'm kind of expecting, well, if that was the problem, then hopefully this will pass now. No such luck. Okay, so something's gone even more wrong than previously. You know, before it was saying expected 258 got two. Now something horrible's happened. So it's complaining about line 41. Let's just say store value value, offset, offset, bits, bits. So let's see what it's doing here. I know I should really learn to use a debugger. So Sorry, I just, I, I, that's just a silly mistake. It would be nice if Ruby had told me that I made this mistake, but I understand why I didn't. I am actually passing nil in there because I forgot to, I forgot to pattern match it here. And because it's in this pattern here, it's, it exists as a local variable whose value is nil. So I didn't get a complaint that I was trying to use this I just got like a weird problem caused by that. Hey, there we go. Okay, great. Well, despite my brain not working correctly there, this actually turned out to be exceptionally easy to implement. I just had to plumb in the storage size. Um, so let's say use storage size when executing uh, store n instructions. Let's say, yeah. Use correct storage size when executing store n instructions. Um, let's say we already had all of the code necessary to do this correctly. It just wasn't connected up uh, to the syntax. Oh, and now I can add, what's it called? Left to right. You 
yeah, I should have made that pending really, but I didn't think. Add left to right dot worst to passing tests. Um, this just uh, needed a correct implementation of the store n instructions. Okay, so it was sort of, you know, it was failing for a reason unrelated to what it was trying to test, but nonetheless it has forced us to get those. You know, it's really weird that all of these other tests involving, you know, s the store test apparently never checked that that was working properly, which seems like a pretty serious oversight to me, but fortunately there was at least one test that checked it. So that's working now. Um... Let's just see what happens with these other ones. I mean, I doubt that they're failing for that reason. I think I must have done this in a different tab and so therefore it's not showing up here. No, damn. So memory grow is still not passing memory size is still not passing. Hmm, okay. And what about a line? This somehow is... The byte is ending up as nil here, which is not a great sign. And what was the deal with that address? Yeah, same problem. Okay. Well, let's look at memory size. I mean, why am I not immediately adding this to the pending test? Maybe it's just because maybe it's because I don't feel particularly confident that. <laughs> that I'm going to be able to make this pass. Well, if I add it to the pending test, then I'll sort of have to, won't I? Let's say we're going to try and get memory size and memory grow working, and then that's a sort of commitment, isn't it? Um... And then I won't have any choice but to get those working. Add memory size dot last and memory grow dot last to pending tests. I'm a little bit concerned about how long memory grow takes to run, but I think I probably just have to suck it up. Like I don't want to skip any of these tests. Um and so I just have to accept that some of them might be a bit slow. Yeah. It's not that slow compared to the other ones. Um, okay, so let's look at size. Why is this failing? So... How many... <laughs> this is where I'm sure... Chris Letter, if he's still watching, will be cursing my lack of line numbers in these assertions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, it looks like, are passing. So let's take a look at this memory size. I mean, specifically, it's invoking uh, this size function, but that's not particularly meaningful. Uh, so those seven are obviously passing fine. That's good. Those seven are passing fine. So we're at 14. Uh, 15, 16 are all passing, and then somehow this one isn't. So let's make a copy of this. Spec 
test core memory size dot last. Copy that here, please. And then this is just going to be memory size. Okay. Oops. So all of those are apparently working fine. Great. All of those are apparently working fine. Great. So what's going on with this? Well, firstly, let me just understand what this test does. So we make a module, we declare a memory that has, in this case, zero pages. That sounded very uncertain, but I think it is pages. Um, Oh, this is the parser. Dolt bytes per page. FFFF. Right. So there's 65,000 bytes per page. There are 8 bits per byte. So this starts out with, I guess, a completely empty memory. Uh, size will return the size of the memory, I believe, in pages. And grow takes a parameter and then grows the memory by that much. So these, these size and grow functions are just glue to allow the assertions to call memory size and memory grow. And this is like a void function that doesn't return anything. Um, whereas I think memory grow returns the previous size of the memory in pages. So we're just dropping that. So, okay. So size is initially zero, grow by one page. Now the size should be one page. Grow by four pages, the size should be five pages. Grow by no pages, the size should be five pages. So that all passes, good. And now we're saying this is exactly the same, but the memory is initially one page large. So these are all the same, this is the same. But now everything is one larger because we started out with an initial size of one page. So that's fine. Now, I don't remember slash I have never known what this means. Zero, two. Oh, is this the maximum size in pages? Yes, I believe it is. And at the moment, I don't think I'm heeding it. Let me just double check that, but that would be borne out. My eyes were wandering down here. So what this is saying is it starts out with an initial size of zero. When we ask to grow it by three, it remains at size zero. When we ask to grow by one, it grows to size one. When we ask to grow by zero, it remains at size one. When we ask to grow by four, it remains at size one. And when we ask to grow by one, it grows to size two. So essentially, if you ask for it to grow beyond its maximum page size, that fails and it doesn't grow. Um, is that borne out by this minimum size three, maximum size or initial size three, maximum size eight? Yeah, this doesn't grow above eight. Um, and then, yeah, there's some assert invalids down here that I don't support. So I think I just have to heed the maximum size because at the moment I've just ignored it. Um, yeah, here from limits, minimum size, maximum size, the minimum size, the maximum size is just completely ignored. Um, trying to think about exactly how I want to store that. I mean, it's a little bit of a mess at the moment in that we're not actually 
remembering how many pages it is we're just this is just represented as a string and we just make it as many bytes as we need and then if anyone asks for its size we just divide it out by the number of bytes per page which is potentially not brilliant but I think maybe I'll uh just live with it for now uh it seems like the obvious way to do this is to say like maximum pages and then all the places where we say new So here, maximum pages, it's just going to be nil, I think. Um, here, well, maybe I'll just call it maximum size. And we'll just have to remember that it's in pages. Uh, what am I doing? Remember Ruby syntax, it will help. So, yeah, I mean, obviously this is a bit of a bodge, but what I'm suggesting here is that I just remember the maximum size every time we... I think those are the uh, these two sort of factories are the only things that make a new memory. Um, perhaps I should make the constructor private so that that is more obvious. But right now, I think all invocation, all creations of memory go through either from string or from limits. Uh, and then I would just need to make sure that grow by I think I just have to say something like if size in pages plus pages well let's say unless size in pages plus pages is greater than maximum size. <laughs> I think maybe that's the clearest way to express that because rather than have this be uh, making this a more complicated inequality that involves the equal sign, I think this is like, unless the bad thing, Unless we've exceeded the maximum size, then just do it. So does this make the test pass? Yes. Okay, well, there are two different things I've done here. One of them is remember the maximum size. Um, oh, in fact, why don't we run the whole thing? Ah, uh, yes, that's no good. Uh, okay. Uh, just park that for a second. Let's get this in. Uh, so this is remember maximum size of memory in pages. Um, memory grow should not have any effect. Uh, let's link to the spec. Um, memory instructions. So hopefully memory grow is in here somewhere. Memory size, memory grow. There's actually quite a lot of detail here. Oh, look. 
there should be a sort of error value here. But I don't know what it is. Oh, maybe it's minus one. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, hold on. It's two to the 32 minus one. Oh, yeah, which is this. Yeah, which is the representation of sine minus one. Right. Well, we haven't done that. Definitely haven't done that yet. All I, all I wanted to do, all I wanted here was a... Uh, memory grow. Why isn't that a link? No one knows. Okay, this will have to do. Um, should not grow the memory if... Um, if doing so would increase it beyond its maximum size. For that to work properly, we first need to know what the maximum size is. So let's just put this in. Um, so the problem we are having is that we need to deal with the fairly common, or at least, I mean, no. Why wasn't this breaking before? Oh, because I deleted all of the previous... Oh, okay. Okay, yes. I deleted all of the previous examples where there was no m maximum. Uh, so let's rethink. What What's this condition? Um, So unless maximum size is nil, or this. So if the maximum size is not specified, then we don't care. If it is specified, oh, no, hold on, I've got this wrong. <sighs> okay, let's just, let's, you should never use unless, should you? If the maximum size is nil, then this is fine. Or the size is acceptable. So I eventually... Yeah, I think I I can't think of a nicer way to write this conditional. I think this is going to fix it though. Yeah. So this is going to be and I'm also going to need to Move this. Well, actually, has this also fixed memory grow? Because it feels like that's what we've we've also changed that. No. Okay. Fine. So that's a different problem, um, which is actually kind of nice because that means I can just move this. Okay. Yes, that's correct. So you can say uh, don't grow. Oh, presumably it's about the return value. Is is going to be the problem with the memory grow? Um, you know, this is you. This test 
this memory size test is really testing what value do we get back from memory size and then it's just using memory grow for its side effects whereas i assume it's the other way around for memory grow well for memory for the memory grow test i don't think we ever need to call size we're just going to be calling memory grow testing the return value to see whether it's minus one or whether we've hit the maximum um or you know whether it's the maximum size and things like that so let's see don't grow memory if it will if that will put it beyond if that will exceed if it would exceed its maximum size I don't think I need to say more than that I'd already justified it in the previous commit with the link to the documentation so that's okay but how are we going to make it work here because clearly a lot of this was fine So let's do the same thing here. Um, a big chunk of these is passing. Oh. Did I just get lucky there? Okay, so there are two skips, and then it's this one that fails. Okay, all right. So we're directly out of failure here. Um, that's interesting. So that's not what I expected. Oh, okay. It's not valid, is it? In, the, in a test like this to just remove these assertions because they all have a side effect. So, I mean, I could get rid of the calls to size and I guess load at zero and all of these but I, I just noticed that the failure message was different. Um, so yeah, it's not that I got lucky. It's that by removing some of these tests, I was causing later. I was causing ones to fail that previously weren't failing. Because I'm looking for this failure specifically. Expected 4294, got 803. Okay, there it is. The, the reason I'm doing this is just to figure out which one specifically is failing. Um, store at zero, load at zero. I can get rid of that one. Get rid of those two. So grow, size, load at zero. Store at zero, load at zero, load at page size, store at page size, load at page size. Okay, so we're getting closer to where the problem is, but it's actually not until the next chunk. It's in here. Grow, 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 grow. Right, okay, yeah, this this is much more I was expecting to see. In fact, I think maybe... Oh... I don't know what happened there. I think maybe I could get rid of all of this because now we're in a new we're in a new module. So yeah, there's it was a red herring that I was I was just breaking the test for an unrelated module by trying to remove them, but this is this is where the real trouble is is I think this one Well, that's interesting. Uh, 
Oh, yes, of course. It was... I wasn't reading this properly. This is the one where we're expecting minus one. I was looking at this at this 800 for some reason. Um, oh, so this doesn't even have an explicit maximum, but I guess there's an intrinsic maximum. Uh, which I haven't paid attention to. So yeah, this is really ringing out the the details of growing the memory. So yeah, it's actually it's actually okay to ask for it to grow by eight hundred because there's no maximum here. But then this is such a large number that it's supposed to freak out and return minus one. Um, So what is that maximum? Let's look at the spec again. Uh, okay, a value of type i32 is on the top of the stack. Pop it from the stack. Let error be the i32 value 2 to 32 minus 1, for which sign 32 of error is minus 1. So that's our error value is going to be minus 1. Either try growing mem by n pages or push the error onto the stack. So it really comes down to this definition of grow mem. Growing memories, if length is larger than 2 to the power of 16, then fail. Okay, so what this is saying is 2 to the 16 is the maximum number of pages. Um, there's also stuff here about updating the type of the memory instance, but I haven't thought about that and I haven't needed to yet. Um, so it seems like superficially, I just need to worry about, you know, making sure that it doesn't grow beyond that number, 65,000 pages. And I haven't quite thought about the details of like, can we implement that by just setting the maximum size to 65,000 pages? If we get something larger. Um, Um, you know, it's something like this, maximum size in pages, or like maximum pages equals, I think that was right. I mean, this, this would be one way to do it, right, is to say we get given the maximum size here, Um, if maximum size isn't nil and maximum size is greater than, well, let's say
what we want to do is say maximum size equals the smallest of Can I do this with clamp? I probably can. What I wanted to say was it's the smallest of maximum size and maximum pages. Let's not suffix that. Um, but I bet I can use clamp. Because I could use a, yeah, I can do this. So it's like, if I want numbers to have a maximum of 100, then if I say like 50 clamp endless 100, then it's clamp to a maximum of 100. If I put in 100, I get 100. If I put in 101, I get 100. So I think maybe I should use clamp here. Um, maximum size dot clamp. Maximum pages. Can I justify sticking that on the end now? No, it's still a bit long. So this is just changing the value that we store. Does that help? No. Because Oh, because <laughs> because in this case, the maximum size is nil. So hold on. Why don't I say if, because effectively there is a maximum size, right? So this, is, this would be essentially saying there's always a maximum size. If we're provided one, then we'll store it, but we'll cap it out at the maximum number of pages. If we're not provided one, then we just implicitly say it's the maximum number of pages. I mean, this still isn't going to make it magically return minus one, but I'm expecting to see something different. Right, so in the, it, it doesn't even try now. So... It, and what I'm responding to there is the fact that it's much faster. <laughs> so that has sort of solved that problem of it being slow. Um, but we've still got the wrong return value. But maybe I can... That feels like something that I can add. Um, limit all memories to 2 to the power of 16 pages. Um, I guess this is it. Um, this is the largest possible memory. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think now the return value is the only problem. So somehow we've got a signal. So what happens when we call grow by? Don't use the return value of this at all. Maybe we could just use the truthiness of this return value because at the moment we just always push the 
Ugh. So this needs to push the previous size. Yeah, size is the previous size. That's what gets pushed onto the upper end stack as opposed to minus one. Um, okay. So let's, okay, let's do some refactoring here. So this can be like previous size is that. So this can be like if grow by pages, else, uh, what is it, signed minus one, but we have to specify how many bits, and apparently it's 32. Oh, it's unsigned. The joke's on me. So I think this will do the right thing if we can make grow by return a truthy result when it succeeds. Which I think perhaps it already does. Let's see. I mean, it, it, it got a lot further. So that does something. And now we've just got this same problem here where it's somehow this byte is becoming nil. Okay, well, I mean, how much does it trouble me that this only incidentally That's fine. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with using the truthiness there. Um, that's idiomatic, isn't it? I mean, it's it's a little bit obscure, but it's exercised by the test suite. Um, uh. Let's make it slightly more explicit. Well, a lot more explicit. I was a little bit uncomfortable with returning the bytes here because that's not really in the spirit of things. So I think this is an opportunity to clean that up slightly. Okay, let's go with that for now. Um, So let's say return boolean from memory grow by uh, to indicate success or failure. Um, Memory.grow is supposed to push minus one onto the stack in the case of failure, but we're not able but we need uh, to be able to detect failure first. Okay, and then we can say uh, push minus one onto the stack when memory.grow fails. And then I can link to this. 
this is what this is how it's supposed to indicate failure. Okay, um, so what's going on with this? How far are we now getting? And I suppose I should run the real memory grow. Yeah, I guess pretty far. Um, so I guess through a bunch of these, let's see. Can I get away with, like, do we have the same problem when I do this? Yeah, just slightly fewer tests. So this looks like it's doing eight and then it's failing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I suspect it's this. Yeah. Now the test is saying test that newly initialized memory is zeroed, which it is. So it shouldn't be failing. So what is this doing in a loop? This looks like it's trying to like even the very first one of these seems to be failing. Is that right? Yeah, it's not even It's not even getting this first assertion, which is a little strange. So this says the memory's got one page in it. We're not gonna, we're not even calling grow yet. We're just calling check memory zero. And that's somehow causing a problem here. So under what circumstances here can byte become nil? That's when we're getting the byte from a particular offset in memory. So this is when we're trying to load So I guess it's this load eight. And we're trying to load it from whatever the address in the local variable is. So this is just giving us some offset. And we're trying to load eight bits at that offset. But somehow it's getting a nil. How does it know when to stop? So we pass in two arguments here. Uh, the local zero is this one. So we pass in zero and FFFF. Um,
I'm not sure I understand. I'm not sure I understand what these parameters are. Um, so here, each time it's growing, it's sort of growing the memory by a page at a time. You know, it starts as being one page and then it grows it by one page and then here it, oh, maybe this is the start and end addresses. So now it grows it by a page and it's saying, right, these are not pages, these are byte, that's what I was confused about, but these are like byte offsets. Because a page is, what, 64K? Yes. Okay, that works out because that's 64K bytes. Okay, so these are the like start and end I guess. So, um, so we set local two to be one. And then now instead we set local two to be the value that's loaded from the starting address. Um, So this breaks out if the value that is read from memory is not equal to zero. Right, and then it restarts the loop. I'm just a bit confused about Oh, okay, right, okay, yeah. I was I was confused about how it succeed how how it signaled success or failure here, but the way it signals it is that this loop keeps going either until it finds a non-zero value in memory, or until it runs out until it you know until it gets to the the last address that's been specified here. Um, either way, it looks like the result that you get is the contents of the last byte of memory it looks at. And so if it found a non-zero one, it will tell you the value of it. Otherwise you get a zero back. So that's why these assertions are all asserting that the that the result is zero. Um, but clearly something is going wrong here. Um, I'm just not sure what. It looks like for some reason it's managing to read off the end of the... It's managing to read off the end of the string. I'm a little bit suspicious of this, but I assume that's, I assume that's correct. 
Um, okay, well, I guess I'll just do some debugging here. Um, let's say offset, offset, bits, bits, um, string dot length, well, string, well, bytes, it's bytes, isn't it? Bytes, byte size, it's bytes dot byte size. I should inspect all of these in case any of them is nil. Okay, so there's gonna be, oh. Yeah, spell byte size correctly. That's embarrassing. I was gonna say there'll be a lot of output and there we go. So, so is this a sort of off by one error where What did it start with? You know, we started looking at zero. I mean, that's the correct value of So it does feel like there's an off by one error here, doesn't there? Like I've, this expects, so this keeps going. It will break out of this loop when the address is greater than or equal to this argument. So I don't think this is right. I don't think this is the right value for how many bytes there should be per page. I think it's off by one. I think it should be this many bytes. Let's just see structure, memories, units of page size. Right. It's six five five three six, and th that is six five five three five. <laughs> so that's why it's that's why it's not working. It's because I got the bloody number wrong. How did I manage that? How did that happen? That was an extremely silly error. Try running the real one. So yeah, I mean, this is this test is going to be painfully slow because it's iterating over a large number of bytes in that memory. But such is life. Okay, that's embarrassing, and I don't know how it happened. Um. Uh, use the correct page size. Uh, well, yeah. 
use the correct memory page size. And I'll say somehow I had made the mistake of setting this to 65535OXFFFF instead of the correct value of 65536OX1. Um, I don't know how this happened. But, I mean, I think that that is going to cause a problem here because it's going to cause that previously pending test to pass. And that's going to count as a failure here. And I think we'll probably get some more because that problem I was seeing, at least this one, and I think probably a line was also failing for the same reason. Yeah, so we're expecting to see this unexpectedly passed. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to need to incorporate that into this previous commit. Oh, come on. Um, so yes, okay, so we've done these two. Grow assertion is failing, size assertion is failing. I'm not sure that was true. Um, now address west is just passing. That's great. Um, um, well, Hopefully a line is failing, but without blowing up. Oh, a line is also passing. That's rather worrying. Well, I guess it just must be that I'm skipping all of the assertions that matter. Loads of assert malformed, which must be important. Loads of assert invalid. Test aligned and unaligned read and write. I don't understand why these are all passing. Like, I'm just not using alignment at all. You know, I, I pause it and then I ignore it. So that's really quite concerning. But for now, these are passing. So I'm happy to add them. That's great. Um, it's just a bit worrying. So this is add address.wast and align.wast to passing tests. I'll just see them. I'll just see this pass. <sighs> yeah, at some point I'm going to have to do something about the speed of these tests because somewhat unsurprisingly the more of them I add the longer they take to run but things like this is going to be quite painful um, let's just say I'm quite concerned that align.wast is passing since I haven't implemented
pointed alignment at all but presumably I'm skipping all of the important assertions in that file oh well it's passing for now so I'll include it in the passing tests for now <sighs> okay I can see that I'm just trying to organize these by what they're missing. We've got a few here that need the import spec test. Um, LM is really just a test of a feature that we don't have yet. I don't think I can even parse this. Yeah, so that might be a good place to start next time. Although I guess the ones where the, we've already got the parser support is kind of easier to deal with. Um, I think that I'm going to wrap it up there for this session because I'm already quite sleepy and it was a bit of wrestling with the loop and block stuff and then getting this memory stuff working was pretty good. Um, I think next time it feels like I could knock several of these on the head by doing the import spec test, um, but I just don't really want to get into that at this late stage in the evening. So I think I'm gonna, let's do the, let's do the traditional treat of seeing the tests run on GitHub. go ah. oh my goodness oh yeah github wasn't happy there for a second i had a unicorn wow Is anything happening? Something's happening. Uh, was that it? No, <laughs> it's still going, okay. All right, well, I, I think this is probably going to pass, but it's um, it took a while to begin, and I know for a fact that these tests are now even slower than they were before, so it might, it might take a little while before we see that. It used to be that this was a nice quick thing to do at the end that would very quickly give, um, give some sort of encouraging feedback, but... Uh, now I've got these slow ones, maybe this is going to be something that I need to kick off earlier if I want to, if I want to close out the stream with it. Yeah, these memory, these memory ones are a killer, aren't they? Okay, I think that passed. Yeah, great. Okay, well. Uh, I think that's it. I don't think I've got anything else to I don't think I've got anything else to show or say. Um that was decent. Um I feel happy to have knocked all of that block branch loop uh redo business on the head. I'm glad to have separated those concerns out. Um I'm glad I got to the bottom of, it was a bit silly that I had the size of the memory, the the size of a page wrong. That's kind of annoying that that problem has persisted for that long. But I flushed it out now, so that's cool. Um, 
yeah, that felt like decent progress. And I think next time I'm probably going to have a look at that um, import spec test stuff because I've been putting that off for a while and it shouldn't be too difficult to do. Um, and if it unlocks a few more passing tests, then that'll be great. But I've already made a few a few tests pass this time. So that was the kind of progress that I was hoping for. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I'm just very sleepy. So it's time for my sleep. I will say bye. And um, yeah, as always, just thanks loads for, thank you to everyone who showed up in the chat. That was a really, it was really nice. Nice to see Yashar, nice to see Chris Zetta, Chris Lois, Tim Morgan showed up, Kevin Newton showed up. Um, and then, yeah, at some later point, Simon Coffey showed up. Um, really lovely to see all of you. I really appreciate you, your implied support by bowling up and, uh, and joining in with the conversation. So, yeah, thanks very much. It's very encouraging and gratifying that people are still at this 100 and, well, you know, getting on for 130 hours now, um, that people are still coming along and seeing what's happening. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, and if you're not one of those people, and yet you're watching this bit, then thank you very much for watching. Um, yeah, I will continue again soon and try and make some more progress. Um, I'm going to go to bed. See you next time. Bye.